This manoir began in the mythical world of werehumans and shapeshifters. A suspicious group of cloaked men brought a little bunny to the territory of deadly black panthers. She overheard them talking ill about her as they plotted to leave her in the panther's forest to be killed and devoured. They were assigned the task by the clan head, who happened to be the bunny's mother. Terrified of being left alone, the bunny fought back to the reasons behind it. It turned out that in the world of these creatures, it was usual for animals to become werehumans by the time they were three, and since the bunny hadn't transformed even after turning 18, her parents and her clan decided she was better off dead. Terry-eyed, she recalled how the priest of their nation declared her cursed, how the maids in her house poked fun at her, and how her family detested her. Just as she pleaded for them not to leave her alone, she heard their screams and some clanking noises. Once that subsided, a mysterious hand picked her up. It was a shape-shifting black panther who smiled at the sight of her tears. Just when she thought someone would sympathize with her, he demanded that she cry some more. The bunny was Vivi Ravian from the noble family of bunnies. The black panther luckily brought her home, instead of eating her on the spot. As she sat on his bed, contemplating to be his next meal, she found that escaping was her only option if she wanted to survive. When she tried to do so, another black panther appeared and caught her. He told her to be careful now that she belonged to Lord Ahin. Just as she wondered what that might mean, he called her his lord's precious emergency meal, making her fall unconscious due to the shock. When she regained her senses, she overheard the doctor talking to the previous panther about her. He said that she didn't exude werehuman pheromones, nor could she be a shape-shifting baby rabbit, since her movements were too mature for that. He deduced she was just an ordinary rabbit. Even when the panther mentioned she could understand human speech, the doctor insisted she was just an ordinary animal. As soon as he was gone, the panther introduced himself as Lud Ivorin, Lord Ahin's right-hand man. Vivi deduced that Ahin must be the one who owned the luxurious room she was in. As Ivorin continued to tease her out of mischief, the anticipated lord arrived. Vivi watched Ahin in fear as he talked to Ivorin about her, revealing that he planned to eat her the next day. Ivorin took his command and said he'd inform the chef about it. He further suggested that grilled rabbit would be the most fitting for breakfast, making Vivi shiver in fear. As night befell, she struggled to sleep with Ahin right next to her, thinking about whether to try and escape. It was impossible to survive the Black Panthers outside of Ahin's flashy residence, and even if she did, Vivi wasn't sure if her family would be too welcoming. Just as she reached to pat Ahin's face out of gratitude for saving her life, he woke up. Seeing her crying again, he asked her if she was scared of being eaten. She nodded, prompting him to tell her to cry some more. She wondered what his obsession with tears was, as she began rubbing her eyes in hopes for her tears to fall. When they didn't, he told her to try again as she wanted him to spare her life. The following morning, Ayn left for his daily duties and left Vivi in a maid's care. Her name was Mamie, and the bunny started enjoying her evenings with her. The evenings consisted of touring the enormous mansion, taking sauna baths, eating luxury food, and strolling around the lush gardens. On one occasion, Vivi tried to escape through the wide-open entrance of the mansion, only for Mamie to throw a dagger at her to block her way. She later told her how dangerous the outside world was and that she was safer within the estate. Ahin returned at night, all bloody and wounded. Vivi watched from a distance as Ivorin rushed to his aid. A physician came along and began stitching his wounds. Ivorin accused the werewolves of the crime. He suggested they send the heads of the werewolves killed by Ahin to the werewolf leader. Ahin discarded the idea and suggested they send 30 of their panthers to their territory and take the head of a higher up instead. After the doctor treated him, he turned to Vivi, commenting on how intelligent and perceptive she was. At night, he sniffed a whiff of pheromones from her neck and called her an anomaly. Vivi, however, wondered how that could be possible since pheromones only exuded from those who had already shakeshifted into humans. When the morning came, Ahin was stunned to find all his deep wounds thoroughly healed. He speculated on Vivi's existence behind it and ordered Ivorin to investigate the aristocratic families in the rabbit territories. During her garden stroll, Vivi came across Ahin's mother, the mansion's owner. She was enchanted to meet the infamous rabbit and had fun with her throughout the evening. She even advised her not to be too obedient with her son, since predators would eat their prey once bored. 
she further told her that she smelled pheromones from her for a brief moment. At night, she recalled that both Ahin and his mother had picked up the scent of pheromones from her. Since beasts had a better sense of smell, she wondered if she could still become a werehuman. When Ahin returned home, he mentioned he got attacked by the werewolves again. Vivi refused to heal him when he demanded her to do so, leading him to threaten to eat her. She instantly changed her mind. Uncertain about what else to do, she licked his face. The wound instantly disappeared, much to her astonishment. Furthermore, Ahin mentioned that he didn't hate what she did. Ahin's mother, Valence Grace, introduced herself to Vivi the following morning as they wandered in the garden. She taught her to hold her breath and press down on her blood vessel, making her experience the feeling of releasing pheromones. However, Vivi barely understood it. Later, Ivorin and Ahin took her to the city in a carriage. As she watched the city for the first time, she was delighted and wondered if she could ever walk up there on her own someday. When they arrived at their destination, Ahin placed her inside his pocket. Initially, the bunny was excited, but all the excitement went down the drain when she came face to face with the building before her. She was at the temple of the same priest that had declared her curse before her family. She was scared as they made their way inside. Once Ahin placed her on a table and went forward to talk to the priest, her memories began to flood in. She recalled all the humiliation she faced in her family and how society had mistreated her. Instinctively, she ran away from the hall. Ahin and Ivorin immediately followed her, but she was faster than them. Soon, Vivi found herself in front of the statue of the animal god and asked him why she couldn't take on human form. Crying, she questioned why she was the only one to live this way. Just then, Ain came and picked her up, relieved that she didn't escape. Ivorin caught up and deduced that she must be an atheist since she detested the temple. Ahin then decided to return home since Vivi didn't like the place. At night, Ahin told her how possessive beasts like him could be, and since he was the one who picked her up, she belonged to him too. Vivi didn't understand him and wondered if it was a threat. The next day, Lady Valence gave Vivi a book about pheromones after learning she could read. According to the book, pheromones were a specific scent and energy that only werehumans possessed. Each species exhibited these chemicals through unique abilities, which in the case of rabbits, was evasion. Just as she was reading, a thud met her ears. Turning around, she found a hen and ivorin holding back their laughter at the sight of her reading. Next morning, as she was hopping through the estate garden with Mamie, an unknown man picked her up. As she was stunned by his golden eyes, wondering if he was a herbivore, his mouth opened to reveal his pointed fangs. She looked at Mamie with innocent eyes, begging her to save him from his clutches. Eventually, she hesitantly asked him to do so. Before he could do so, Ahin appeared and demanded that the man put the rabbit down. As he picked her up, he scolded her for having the lion's scent on her. Hearing the word lion, she shuddered in fear. As Ahin took her back to his room, he couldn't stand the stench of the lion on her. Loon Manions was the name of the lion shapeshifter who was staying in Ahin's estate to attend the upcoming Grace family ball. Just then, Ivorin arrived with his report on the rabbit family. He deduced from the report that Vivi was discarded by her family to be eaten by the Werepanthers. Angry, he ordered Ivorin to kill anyone who might come looking for the rabbit. At nighttime, Mamie bathed Vivi to rid her of the lion stench. Ivorin suggested Ahin assign a name to the rabbit as it had been a month since Ahin picked her up. He dismissed Ivorin and dipped Vivi's paws in ink, ordering her to write down her name on a paper sheet. After some struggle, she managed to do so. Ahin was delighted to know her name was Vivi. Later, Ahin bit her neck and licked her fur to get rid of the scent of the lion. During the process, Vivi felt dizzy and could smell his strong pheromones. Eventually, she fainted when she couldn't take it anymore. When Vivi regained consciousness, she was already in Ahin's bed. He was soundly sleeping, but much to her surprise, when she reached out for him, she didn't see paws but a fair human hand. At the Levian household, Vivi's mother and brother discussed what might have become of the rabbit. Since the ones they sent to leave her in the forest did not return, they wondered if they got their job done and if Vivi was dead. To ease her worries, the son suggested they send another group of servants to confirm Vivi's status, and she agreed with his suggestion as they both wished the rabbit was dead. The servants complied with the orders they were given. They found the bones of their peers in the territorial forest, implying they had been killed and devoured by the panthers. Just then, Ahin and Ivorin appeared out of the blue 
and questioned if they were searching for a rabbit. The question caught their instant location, leading Ahin to reveal that he, in fact, picked it up and the rabbit was now in his custody. Ivorin suspected that the suspiciously cloaked men were there to kidnap Vivi. As a result, Ayn decided it was best if he killed them. Hearing this, the rabbits knew they were outnumbered and possibly couldn't survive a carnivore's attack. Deciding to sprint and split at the first opportunity they ran, only to be caught by a hen's panthers. Furthermore, hen's strong pheromones paralyzed them, making it easier for his panthers to devour them on his orders. Before the last one died, Ahin interrogated him to learn more about Vivi's identity. The perpetrator told him that she was, in fact, a werehuman who was already 18 years old. When Ahin expressed how he had never seen her shapeshift, he called her a freak of nature, implying that she had never transformed. Meanwhile, Vivi was awake late at night, reading the book Madame Valence had given her. She was stunned to learn that among foxes, those blessed with extremely powerful pheromones often had late humanization. She recalled how a hen had sensed pheromones from her and wondered if that was the case with her too. Suddenly, a suspicious maid in a hen's room turned into a werewolf and attacked her. Vivi noticed how her red eyes resembled those of panthers, despite being a sturdy wolf. As the wolf chased after her, Vivi ran away from it as fast and as efficiently as she could. Hanging from the balcony, she luckily detected a hen and manians in the garden, but the dense creatures failed to understand her when she waved at them to request help. Suddenly, the wolf advanced in her direction, making her lose her balance and fall. Ayn caught her on his head. Before he could question her any further, Mamie called out to Vivi from the balcony, with her clothes stained blood red. Ahin and Manians then detected the scent of a wolf, causing Ahin to wipe away Vivi's tears and tell her not to cry again. Ivorin later explained that the maid had infiltrated their estate by taking advantage of temporary employee inductions on account of the upcoming ball. She was a hybrid born to a werewolf and a werepanther. However, Vivi didn't understand why she got attacked. If the maid was hungry, she could have gone hunting for something bigger and more filling. But if she had just been curious to eat Ohin's emergency meal, that would be a different story. When he mentioned the ball, Vivi's ears instantly perked up. She had seen balls at her house back in rabbit territory, but wondered what a ball in such an enormous mansion would be like. At night, Ahin snuggled into his bed and told Vivi that within his territory, they usually beheaded the servants who disobeyed orders. Considering that, Mamie would meet the same fate since she was assigned to guard Vivi and had failed. The bunny asked him to spare her life since she really liked her. Ahin agreed, but on one condition. He told her he'd spare her if Vivi promised him she'd never cry in front of anyone else again. She was allowed to cry in front of him, especially when he'd ask her to do so. Vivi didn't understand it completely but made the promise nonetheless. That night, Vivi thought back to how she once saw a human arm extending from her. It was after Ahin had bit her neck. She deduced that it was either because of his fangs or strong pheromones. Trying to test her hypothesis, she worriedly approached the soundly sleeping Ahin. She extended her paw into his agape mouth to check if his fangs could catalyze her humanization. But much to her dismay, all the hen ended up doing was suckle at her paw like a pacifier. The following morning was that of the ball. The Grace family hosted a ball every six months, and shapeshifters from all territories, especially lions and bears, always answered their invitations. As an excited Vivi watched beautiful werehumans dressed in gorgeous ball gowns from the window, Mamie approached her with the Grace family fashion designer. Mamie informed her that Ahin had chosen her to be his partner at the ball, much to her chagrin. She truly wanted to enjoy the ball, but didn't want to put herself in danger. She was not stupid enough to present herself before an overwhelming crowd of canines just to wear a fancy dress. But since she couldn't speak, no one could listen. The designer quickly dressed her in a cute necklet and a crown. Later, Ivorin came to escort her to the ball. Of course, she didn't let Ivorin take her away easily and landed a few good kicks across his face. He dramatically declared how she must have a mighty gladiator's blood running through her veins, praising her strong kick. On their way to the ballroom, Vivi hid inside Ahin's pocket. When Ivorin asked him why he had chosen Vivi to be his partner for the ball, Ahin answered that he wouldn't need to dance with somebody else if he already had a partner. When they entered the ballroom, all eyes instantly turned to Vivi. 
Since everyone had heard of the Grace family's new cherished pet, they were all delighted to see her in person. After a while, Vivi started feeling dizzy due to the pheromones that so many carnivores were exuding. Just then, Madame Valence arrived and greeted Vivi. She apologized for not being there for her sooner after hearing about the wolf attack, so to compensate, she hung the dead wolf's head on the mansion's gate to serve as a warning to the others. She also picked up on the fact that Ahin and his mother were not on good terms with each other and often picked up on each other's shortcomings as the current and next clan leaders. After dancing an awkward waltz with the rabbit, Ahin sat peacefully on a settee, teaching Vivi about different clans and their power differences when a young, beautiful woman approached him. She was a member of the fox clan and exuded very strong pheromones. She invited Ahin to visit her territory sometime, only for him to refuse, when she finally left the scene, Vivi started feeling dizzy and nauseous, possibly thanks to her pheromones. Ahim got worried for her, and before he could do anything, she fled the scene. Breathing heavily and in a lot of pain, she hid herself in a random room down the hallway. As she panted, the pain began to subside. She wondered if she was dreaming when she saw tresses of white hair splattered across the floor. It reminded her of her mother's hair. But when she reached out to touch it, she saw a human hand extending from her. Baffled, she quickly got up and touched her face to see if it was real. But her anxiety proved to be true when she saw her reflection in the mirror. She had become human. Finally, she borrowed a quilt from the room to protect her bare skin from the cold and hid herself under the table. She was scared to let Ahin know about her humanization, wondering if he would think she had deceived him. Suddenly, she heard footsteps and saw a pair of feet approaching her. It was Maniums who had come after her scent, looking for her. But when he pulled the tablecloth, he found a beautiful, naked woman instead. Flustered, he fell flat on his back. And when Vivi tried to get up, she stumbled over him too. After calming down, Maniums asked her who she was. She didn't answer him, so he assumed she was the rabbit. When he said it out loud, Vivi instantly denied it. Although he said that she reeked of Ahin's pheromones and possessed the rare violet eyes of the rabbit clan, she still denied her identity. Suddenly, the door of the room clanked open and Ahin barged in. Seeing the were lion, he lost his cool and demanded Ivorin for his sword. Ivorin refused to let him handle the problem violently since they were dealing with a clan leader's son. Ahin, on the other hand, refused to listen to all logic. He questioned Manians about how he could steal his belongings so casually in his territory. Surprised at the allegation, when Manions looked at his side, he found Vivi in her rabbit form hiding under the quilt. He picked her up instantly, but before he could tell Ahin anything, she kicked him across his face. Ahin took her back, and Manions earned fame among the guests as a pet thief. As he walked out of the mansion, he recalled how Vivi was drenched in Ahin's scent. He wondered if he had fallen in love with his pet after all. But witnessing how the rabbit had reacted to her identity being revealed, he knew she was hiding it from Ahin. However, he did not understand why. When the night came, Ahin was slouched in his room out of disappointment. He expressed how one shouldn't leave his master to side up with a lion of all beasts. Ivorin repeated all his dialogues to Vivi, thinking that Ahin was addressing her. Suddenly, he snapped and picked up his sword to threaten Ivorin, revealing that it was him to who he had been talking. Ahin reminded him how he sided with the lion when he demanded his sword. Ivorin apologized, but the panther told him to leave at once. He then turned to Vivi and told her he knew she was a were-rabbit, much to her surprise. That is why he hid her pheromones with his own, so no one else could find her secret. He also told her that he knew she had never transformed into a human before. Receiving her questioning gaze in response, he explained that he came across some members of her clan. They told him everything about her peculiarity when they entered the Werepanda territory one day. They came to confirm Vivi's death when he caught them by his fangs, implying that they were now dead. Ahin further told her that he liked the fact that she was a rabbit, because if she were a human, it would become awkward. But despite it all, Vivi still wanted to be a full-fledged human one day. Later in the evening, En assigned his trusted panther, Ash, to guard Vivi. He told the panther that the bunny was now her master and that, no matter what, she couldn't let her get hurt. Even though Vivi was instantly terrified when she first saw Ash, she quickly grew fond of her docile nature. That evening, she practiced releasing her pheromones like Madame Valence had taught her to do. At night, Ahin commented on how thickly she smelled of them and despite her protests, bit her neck to cover her up with his own pheromones. 
When she woke up in the middle of the night, expectedly, there were no paws in sight but the arms of a human. After acknowledging that she had turned into a human again, she needed to get out of Ahin's bed. The only problem was his heavy arm resting over her frail frame. When she tried to slip out, Ash's predatory eyes froze her in her place, but she soon realized that both Ash and Ahin were fast asleep. Recording some past events, she deduced that the novel ability of her pheromones was possibly putting others to sleep. As she struggled to escape Ahin's grip, it only got stronger. Eventually, she managed to get out. Ash woke up right then and draped a quilt around her shoulders. That night, she slept with the panther on the floor. When Ahin woke up surprisingly well-rested the following morning, he found Vivi in her rabbit form, sleeping next to Ash. Just as he got out of his bed, he found strands of angelic white hair on his sheets. He knew instantly what it was. When he woke Vivi up, he questioned her about how she got to the floor. Not wanting to let him speculate on her overnight humanization, she nodded when he asked if Ash had taken her away. As a punishment, Ahin declared she'd share the room with Ivorin from then onward. Terrified of the panther's fate, Vivi begged Ahin to reconsider as a clueless pet panther watched the scene from a distance. Just as Vivi was begging him to reconsider, his bare shoulder caught her attention. She internally cursed him for looking so breathtaking early in the morning. Simultaneously, she also cursed herself for falling into the devil's trap and finding him attractive. Ahin noticed her flustered gaze and offered to show her more of him. She shut her eyes in embarrassment immediately. And when she opened them, Ivorin's face came into her line of sight instead, much to her dismay. In the evening, at a lady's tea party in the herbivore territory, some women discussed the glamorous ball of the Grace family. One of them mentioned the rumor that the family had recently adopted a new pet. According to the said rumor, the next next leader of the panther clan was quite fond of his pet, so much so that he brought it as his partner to the ball. When someone questioned what kind of pet it was, the woman informed them it was a cute little rabbit. Right then, a teacup fell to the floor, shattering completely. It belonged to Vivi's mother, Lady Levian, who had also joined the party. Later, at a meeting between the carnivores, it was revealed that an illicit drug was being smuggled from the fox territory. It was causing addiction by simulating animal pheromones. At the meeting, Ahin was in a particularly bad mood, leading Manians to wonder what was up. Before the meeting's conclusion, he eventually questioned the lion about the ball and if something interesting happened that day. After thinking hard and recalling that Vivi didn't want her identity to be revealed, Manian simply denied it. In the evening, Ahin came home and offered to take both Vivi and Ash with him on a trip. They were supposed to visit Andalus, the center point where the drug smuggling was taking place. It was an area possibly swarmed with foxes, as Ivorin said, but Ahin didn't pay much heed to it. He simply said that he wanted to spend more time with Vivi. Ivorin commented how he had been infatuated with the rabbit lately, going as far as to join his mother on her evening tea just to be around Vivi. Jokingly, Ivorin wondered if he had contracted rabbititis. Ahin ignored his chatter and ordered him to read his report instead. According to the reports, they either needed to get their hands on the drug or its distributor. Since the drug caused different symptoms in different people, it was likely to be one in the process of experimentation. If they were to catch either of those, it could lead them to its origin. Just as he finished his report, the carriage got ambushed by the foxes. Ahin or the rest didn't seem scared, however. Vivi was in a state of panic. Ivorin assured her that this sort of thing happened very often and that it would end instantly too. Ahin stepped out of the carriage alone. Everyone else was packed inside it with the windows down on his orders. Ivorin explained how the foxes would never stand a chance against his extremely strong pheromones. Just then, their carriage's window shattered and Vivi could instantly sense his pheromones. As she began suffocating and feeling dizzy, Ash noticed it and instantly fled the carriage with Vivi in her mouth. She immediately took her to an abandoned cottage in the woods. As Vivi struggled to stay conscious, two werefoxes entered their den. They could sense Vivi's pheromones and decided to kill both the panther and the rabbit on the spot. But much to their surprise, Ash defiantly attacked them. Even though she was a no match against their pheromone enhanced defense, she struggled against them as long as she could. Vivi watched the scene in pure horror. Tears were streaming down her face. As she pleaded for Ash to stop putting her life on the line, a burst of pheromones exuded from her. As a result, the foxes became dizzy, and Ash took advantage of it to finish them off. But even if the werefoxes were dead, Ash had taken too much damage. Due to the blood loss, she fell unconscious. As Vivi cried for her to wake up, she transformed into a human. While Ash and Vivi were running away, Ahin and Evelyn wondered why Ash took her and decided to go off the charts. 
Ahin orders Evelyn to take care of the attackers while he runs off to chase after Ash with a lot of curiosity. Running in desperation, Ahin starts thinking about the worst-case scenario, Vivi turning into a human because she's already 18. He then reminds himself of all the four times Vivi has acted out of place and strangely. Ahin finally cracks the code of all four cases and concludes that whenever Vivi takes pheromones from other people, she runs away and potentially turns into her human form. He opens the door and sees the sad sight of Vivi in her human form, hugging the injured Ash. Surprisingly enough, Ahin looks at Vivi's eyes and hair and feels the pheromones he covers on her. He quickly recognizes her without a second thought. After learning that Vivi is in her human form, Ahin cannot grasp this fact and quickly covers his jacket around Vivi, who seems to be wearing no clothes. They both worry about Ash, whose wounds are much more profound than they thought, and he will probably die even before they reach a doctor. Vivi started crying and took the blame for Ash's death on herself. She starts begging Ash not to die, and suddenly, Ash's wounds are fixed, which seems to be because of Ahin's overpowering pheromones. He seems to have a suspiciously dead serious face and asks the girl who she is. Vivi told him that just a moment ago, he was calling her Vivi, which surprised Ahin again. He holds Vivi and asks her, don't you have a lot of things to say? Vivi replies to Ahin and asks him if he isn't going to interrogate her anymore. Suddenly, Vivi can't breathe and complains that she can't control anything. Vivi seems to be in so much pain, but Ahin reaches her neck and bites her to stabilize her breathing. Ahin's pheromones are flowing in and pressing against Vivi's pheromone. Her pain is going away little by little, and it's getting easier for Vivi to breathe now. Even though she can breathe, her body has practically no strength left, but the dizziness is almost gone. While they are having this romantic moment, the door bangs and Mayo sees the scenario and freaks out, but Ahin tells him to close it. Evelyn also joined them, and as always, he started being overprotective and knocked on the door to know the situation. He also asked Ahin whether the rabbit was okay, and Ahin told him that she was perfectly fine. Vivi points towards her neck with a love mark etched on it and told Ahin it's not okay. Ahin tells her that it's not the first time she has turned into a human being, and Vivi asks him how much he knows about her. Saying this, she fell asleep as it was such a tiring day. After some time, Ahin and Vivi come outside in her rabbit form, and Evelyn starts reporting the situation to Ahin. He said they managed to win the battle even though the carriage was overturned due to their attack. Evelyn then suggested to Ahin that it would be best if they go to Vendalris, which is close to them, instead of going back to their mansion without any form of carriage. They finally reach Endalris, where Vivi wakes up in her rabbit form and seems relieved. One of the guys from Endalris is stunned to see a small rabbit who can tame a panther. They finally meet the lion, who also seems surprised or more as he acts like it, because he's already seen Vivi in her proper form. This is where Reston, Lion's guard, properly greets Vivi. After the introduction, Loon asked Vivi if she should turn herself into a human again so they could have a proper conversation, but Vivi replied that it was not up to her. Loon started getting suspicious, wondering whether she approached Ahin on purpose or hid the fact that she was a shapeshifter so she could leak the Grace family's secrets. He also wonders what Vivi can do with a small body since she's pretty powerless. While they are having this chatter, Loon gets serious and goes outside with Panther to find two people standing and talking to each other. It is revealed to be two workers talking to each other, but one of the workers handed the other one a drug that spread around the Endalus region, causing a lot of diseases. Loon instantly catches onto the situation and immediately jumps out of the window to confront the two workers. Loon gets ready to knock out the workers and wonders who he should knock out first. He realized that he had left his sword behind and asked the workers to hand over the drug that they had. One of the workers quickly tries to punch Loon, but Loon elbows him and knocks him out easily. The other one tried to run, but being the lion, Loon easily caught him up, leaving the worker in shock and fear. He then catches the bottle and realizes it is a suspicious powder drug. Some of the powder got to Loon, which turned him into an actual lion, shocking Vivi. On the other end, Ahin and Evelyn are thinking about the drug and how they could not get any clues about its origin or who the person supplying them. Evelyn abruptly asked if he intended to keep the rabbit with them, to which he replied that Evelyn was the one who told him to use anything useful to them. When they reached the palace, they saw Vivi, a lion, and a panther running in a line, which surprised them. They both got so awkward, wondering what was going on. All of them decided to run after the weird situation that was ongoing. 
After explaining the whole situation, they started roaming around the town, hoping to find friends and innkeepers to know more about the drug. This is where Evelyn wonders why Loon ran in his shapeshifting form, to which Ahin replies that either they were playing or he was exposed to the pheromone-related drugs. On the other end, we see Loon and Vivi together. Vivi was running away from Loon because he was so scared and not because she thought he had become an evil monster. It is then revealed that the innkeepers were hyena shake shifters who wanted to disrupt their systems. Suddenly, Ahin appears and looks quite pissed at Loon. He quickly picks up Vivi and is pretty sad as she hurt herself by running so much for a long time. Loon finally tries to explain the situation to him, but fails because he's in his lion form, so there's a lot of communication gap. Suddenly, a couple of tough-looking guys appear, and old Ahin comes with them. Surprisingly enough, Ahin turns his eyes blue instead of fighting and begs them to spare him playfully. This was a truly jaw-dropping moment for Loon and Vivi because they expected the crazy panther to fight them. They all go with the suspicious-looking guys, and their hands are tied except Vivi's. Vivi is even offered a carrot, which makes both Loon and Ahin laugh. At this point, Vivi just wants to leave and go home. However, it was revealed that all of this was part of Ahin's plan, so they could infiltrate the enemy's camp. He also understood that the Enderous drug must have a relation with these people. Ahin asks Loon and Manians whether he can return to his human form, to which he simply nods no. Ahin then reveals that Black Panthers have to disguise themselves, so they use the raccoon family drug to do undercover missions like these. Vivi's pheromones started acting crazy, and it looked like she was about to turn into her human form. Ahin decided to run away and destroy the Iron Door with relative ease to save her secret from the enemies. The enemies come and get destroyed by the powerful Panther Lord. While all the real action is happening, Evelyn and the other guys still wonder what is going wrong all this time. They are casually talking about finding the Merchant Guild building. Here, Loon's assistant tells them that the guys who took Lord Loon and Lord Ahin were taking them far away from the town center, which seems quite suspicious. He also wonders about the deal with that rabbit, but Evelyn decides to keep her shape-shifting abilities a secret from everyone. He deflected the conversation by saying there was a strange smell, and the loon's guard agreed. On the other side, Ahin and Vivi got caught hiding in a closet, where they were found by the same guard who was kind towards Vivi. Seeing how cute Vivi was, the guard decided to mislead his people, all to save Vivi and Ahin. He also wonders whether the gorillas are friendly to rabbits because he keeps protecting Vivi on every occasion he can. As they are about to escape the closet, Vivi turns into her real self, which surprises him even more. Seeing Vivi in her natural form, he is surprised and wonders why she seems angry. Vivi gets so flustered, and Ahin tells her that it would be nice if she could give him a heads up every time she shapeshifts. He then continues and says that every time she's about to turn into a human, she should start dancing so he will know beforehand. He tells Vivi what her reaction would be if Ash suddenly turned into a human, to which she realizes that she would be surprised. Making Vivi blush again and again, she agrees to dance the next time she's about to turn human. Vivi seems to be in a different mood, and she wonders whether he's aroused in a situation like this. Seeing this, Ahin takes a chance and quickly tells her that his gaze looks slightly different. While they were flirting with each other, they heard some other guards reporting about a lion running crazy. Loon seems quite annoyed at Ahin and wants to kill him because he made his life difficult. While Ahin is jumping out of the window with Vivi in his hands, everyone witnesses this moment. Evelyn runs towards Ahin and asks him who is this person in the white clothes, but Ahin asks him where the wagon is. Now we see the gorilla joining the conversation, and Ahin tells him to take them to the nearest clinic. He wonders why there was a woman instead of the rabbit in his hand this time. The gorilla turned into a horse, and everyone got surprised since they expected him to be from a gorilla heritage. On the other hand, everyone was confused to see this situation. As soon as Evelyn told Ash to come, Ash ran off the fence. He then turns into a panther and decides to follow Ahin and Vivi. We see Vivi's flashback to a rabbit getting bullied by her peers. People ridicule her for her inability to turn into a girl which is so depressing. Even though everyone talks to her just fine on purpose, they despise her and think she's not even worth killing. Suddenly, we see the same past where she was abandoned in the Panther's territory and was left behind by her peers so the pride of her clan won't hurt. 
In the next scene, we see Ahin and Vivi riding the horse as Ahin begs her not to lose consciousness. They finally reach a doctor, and she quickly recognizes the panther. While they treat her, Vivi says she's jealous of Ahin because he seems to have everything in life. On the other hand, she seems like she's been cursed by her very birth. Vivi wonders whether Ahin has cursed her. The doctor wonders what causes Vivi to act this way because it doesn't seem like a side effect of the drug. She concluded by saying that it's not because of the drugs, but because of the pheromones. Ahin receives a pheromone stabilizer and then decides to take her away. But Vivi gains consciousness and tells him that she hates this feeling and it hurts so much. He then decides to bite her again to overpower her pheromone, and it is revealed that Ahin's pheromones are from the domination class. Even the doctor is surprised to see how strong and superior he is. However, the doctor warned that he shouldn't be biting Vivi because a herbivore's body isn't the same as the beast's. She then suggested that even though it is safer to let the pheromone flow into the body, he should use other methods rather than external ones. Now, we all know what the doctor was talking about. Catching on quickly, Ahin started kissing Vivi. After their long kiss, the pain disappeared gradually, curing Vivi to perfect health. The treatment has gone well, and we see Vivi resting while everyone else sleeps except Ahin. He's sitting gracefully and wondering that he was about to lose himself in Vivi's pheromones, which would have been quite dangerous. He then pinches Vivi's nose because she looks quite comfortable just resting. However, despite being so playful with Vivi, Ahin tells himself that he must be careful and not get consumed by Vivi's pheromones. He wonders why her pheromones are this strong and that she might be the head successor due to her overwhelming flow. While he's thinking deep in his head, the door knocks and Evelyn appears. He apologized for being late and told him that there was a person resembling a gorilla who was trembling outside while being naked. As he goes inside, Ahin wonders whether she will decide to go back home now that she's in her human form. All sorts of questions arise in his head while Vivi is resting. Now he starts talking to Ash, saying that she has turned into a human. After waking up, Vivi realizes she's still a human and hasn't changed into a rabbit. This fact stunned her, and she was surprised to see herself in a human image. She wonders why she hasn't turned into a rabbit, and suddenly, the doctor comes in with some tea and tells her that stretching right after waking up after two days might not be the best idea. She revealed to Vivi that her partner was right here, but now he's gone to buy some clothes for her. Vivi is quite surprised that the doctor is a capybara shapeshifter and was quite nice to her all this time. She then remembers how Ahane kissed her and started blushing in nervousness. After a while, Vivi goes outside to see Ash and Loon, who seem quite pissed off. He wants to take revenge playfully, but is completely bullied by Vivi and Ash. After the bullying, Vivi finds herself on Loon, making the situation awkward. On the other hand, it looks like Evelyn is lying somewhere, and Vivi gets angrier at Loon, thinking he made such a big mess. Moreover, once Ahin returns, he sees an interesting side of Evelyn and the gorilla being tied up. And on the other hand, he sees a dead pigeon and wonders who did all this. Loon and Vivi are currently in the dressing room, but Vivi appears to be quite nervous overall. Loon reassured her by mentioning that this wasn't their first time being in the same room together. As she conversed with Loon, she realized that despite his occasional intimidating presence, he wasn't a bad person at all. As their conversation ended, Vivi's clothes were being prepared, and Loon seemed to be quite excited about what was to come. We see Vivi changing into the cutest dress of all time. Now she's eating food with Loon, and he has prepared many interesting foods for her. Vivi seems excited, especially because she's been eating greens all this time. Restin seems shocked because it's the first time he learns that Vivi is a shapeshifter. He makes a big deal out of it, but Loon stops him at once. Vivi asked Restin why he was rude to her, and Restin quickly died inside now that he had to take on a higher level of accountability. Suddenly, Vivi decides to move away, but is stopped by Loon. Vivi thinks everyone might have been using her because of her healing abilities. She seemed betrayed, angry, and sad at the same time. Her mixed emotions seemed to drive her away from everyone. Looking at Loon, she accidentally healed his wound and now she wants to turn into a rabbit before returning home. She then wonders if Amy, Ash, Evelyn, 
and Mrs. Valens are waiting for them. Vivi needs clarification about whether she should return to Ahin, who might use her to his advantage. After getting angrier, she tells Loon to stop following her and that Ahin will soon be here. She opens the door to see Ahin waiting for her. Ahin seems happy to see Vivi and tells her that she looks gorgeous in her outfit. She asks Ahin why he is looking for her, to which he replies that he thinks Vivi would be scared alone. Even though Vivi's pent-up anger was slowly leaking away, she was innately surprised to see Ahin, which gave her a sense of security. Ahin told her they were going home together, which melted her heart. He then tells Vivi to jump off the balcony so he can catch her and makes fun of her for being scared of jumping off. However, Vivi mustered up the courage and jumped right into Ahin's hand, her beautiful hair spiraling across the air. As soon as she got into Ahin's arms, she turned into a rabbit, and everything seemed normal. Madame Valence seems sad at home because she hasn't seen Vivi in over a week. She then wonders where Ahin is, since his grandfather is here, and he hasn't even greeted him yet. Ahin's grandfather talks about Loon, who has grown a lot since the last time he has seen him. Both father and daughter have some chatter with each other regarding Ahin's birthday. Ahin's grandpa then talks badly about his father, who was always irresponsible and hadn't given his proper time to the family. We are taken to Ahin's side of the story, where he's trying his best to investigate the drug. The drug seems not to affect Vivi at all. He then tells the scientist to investigate the drug more and not tell anyone about it. Ahin talks to himself and says that he's quite relieved that the drug does not affect Vivi, but the mud-colored powder makes him quite uncomfortable. Suddenly, Evelyn comes in and starts reporting his tasks for the day, but Ahin suddenly points at the door and asks Vivi to stop eavesdropping. He then laughs and thinks this whole situation is kind of funny. He opens the door to find Ash and Vivi listening to their conversation. At that moment, Evelyn asks Ahin about the woman he was within the cabin the other day, and Ahin responds by telling Evelyn that there's nothing more he wants to disclose. He simply told Evelyn that he should think about why he didn't ask him about Miss Rabbit for a couple of days. Thinking about this, Evelyn dropped the papers from his hand and quickly realized that the girl and the rabbit had some sort of connection. Ahin says that since her transformation didn't leave her any scars like other people, it might be a temporary transformation. After their brief talk, Ahin comes to his room to find Vivi, and he tells her that she's made disappearing her habit and puts her in bed while resting. Things have been different since Vivi and Ahin had a lot of romantic moments before, so Vivi seems quite a shy person this time. Ahin then tells Vivi that it's annoying that they haven't talked that much. He goes as far as to offer her to turn into a human so they can have a meaningful conversation. However, Vivi, in her rabbit form, tries her best to make Ahin understand that it hurts when she undergoes this transformation and he understands her sign language after failing three times. Ahin is surprised to know that even a normal transformation makes her suffer from a lot of pain. He then asks her whether she's been suffering alone all this time, even before meeting him. Being all angry, Ahin goes to sleep and says he wants to rip everyone who hurt her to shreds. The next day, everyone meets about the drug, and even though they have captured a lot of guys from the abandoned house, they still need to get important information about the drug. Loon and Ahin started teasing each other, saying that one was superior to the other. Evelyn tells them that there is a chance that Miss Rabbit might rule the continent, and everyone is surprised. Loon thinks that since she left his mansion, his wound has healed easily, and she might be different from other shapeshifters. Ahin and Loon again started teasing each other, giving no room for each other even to breathe. In the end, Ahin won the argument because the rabbit's natural enemy is a lion. At home, Vivi thanks the maid for bringing her to the library and gives her full permission to pat her as much as she wants. Vivi started reading a book about the healing class of pheromones. She finds that records aren't easily obtainable regarding healing pheromones, as there aren't many shapeshifters with this ability. She continued reading and started learning more and more about her healing abilities as a shapeshifter. Vivi understands more about her body and concludes that once she can control her pheromones better, she might be able to transform into a human being. Suddenly, a sound comes from the side, and it is revealed to be Ahin's grandfather, who gets surprised to see a rabbit reading a book. 
Now we are taken to a different scene where all the royal family members are sitting, watching the crowd in a stadium. Lady Valence told Ahin that if he knew he would be this bored, why didn't he bring the rabbit with him? However, Lady Valence has some kind of obsession with Vivi. Everything it's about the rabbit. She gets excited and misses her all the time. Ahin remembers that, at first, her surprised reaction was just amusing. Now he wonders what she thinks about him. He also wonders why she hates temples so much. This is where Valence tells Ahin that there's a big gap between herbivorous and beast shapeshifters. He then asks her mother that he's going to need her advice. Lady Valence then told Ahin that his grandfather was here, and this news took him by surprise. He couldn't help but feel anxious about how his grandfather would react when he meets Vivi. Being intrigued, Ahin calls Evelyn and switches clothes with him to go back and talk to Vivi. At home, Ahin's grandfather thinks the world's end might be near because he just witnessed a rabbit who can understand his speech. Mamie told Grandpa that according to Lord Ahin, she's his emergency food. To this, his grandpa is even more stunned and just can grasp that there's so much suspicion going on. It's almost funny. He told the maid to call Ahin right now since he wanted to talk to him. And Mamie replied that he was at the Grand Temple for the memorial ceremony and would return before evening. Ahin's grandpa then takes Vivi to the memorial, and she is stunned because she doesn't like temples. Resisting repeatedly, Vivi finally snapped and turned into her human form while knocking everyone around her, including Ahin's grandfather. She is surprised to see that her abilities have grown. She takes off the guard's clothes and wears them while thinking about what she should do in this case because if anyone finds her out, they will point at her neck immediately. As she opens the window, she sees Rill, the gorilla, gazing at her with an adorable expression on his face. Vivi couldn't resist but asked Rill to save her. Rill takes her to a barn, telling her to wait until he gets some clothes. He pointed at a horse, saying it was the favorite horse of Lord Ahin, whom no one wanted to be near. The horse seems quite angry, but he tells Vivi that it wouldn't jump off the fence, so there's nothing to worry about. He also warns Vivi to stay comfortable where she is because she wouldn't want to get hit by him since there will be many injuries. As soon as Rill went outside, the horse jumped out of the fence, which shocked her. However, Vivi is surprised that the horse is just patting her and doesn't dislike her. An hour later, Rill returns and he's surprised to see that she's still in one piece. Vivi thanks Rill for his help but he tells her that he's surprised that Ahin's horse, Jane, likes her so much. He then continues to tell Vivi that the stable keeper who takes care of her every day also gets attacked, and she's probably the only person Jane hasn't attacked yet. Vivi replied that it could be because of Ahin's pheromones all over her body. As they spent more time together, Vivi shared her story with Rill, and it moved him to tears. Curious, Rill asked if Vivi planned to return to her original territory someday. She replied that she did indeed plan to go back home eventually. Rill was intrigued and asked if Vivi was afraid of the powerful beasts that roamed the area. Vivi admitted that she was still scared of their overwhelming abilities, as herbivores and beasts were vastly different in terms of power. Sympathetically, Rill noted that it must be even harder for Vivi to survive in this place as a small rabbit. Just as Vivi was about to respond, the door suddenly burst open and someone rushed into the room before either of them could catch a glimpse of who it was. The scene cuts off here, and we are taken to Ahin's side of the story as he returns to the palace. He finds out that all the servants and his grandfather are lying on the ground, which seems so odd. He woke Mamie up, and she told Ahin how his grandfather was taking Vivi to the temple to question her abilities. Knowing this, Ahin reads the situation carefully and wonders where she is. Now it's night, and we're taken back to the barn. It seems like the beast that came into their barn was Ash. She looks for Ash, who has disappeared after appearing suddenly. Vivi sees a tail and assumes that it's Ash, only to discover that it is some other beast who is circling her now. Vivi gets scared and gets frozen in her place. She wonders whether she should use her pheromones to put this beast to sleep, but if she fails, she will transform into a rabbit and become free food for the panther. As soon as the beast started to attack Vivi, a sword came out from nowhere, shocking the panther. It is revealed to be a hen who was angry at Barra. 
the panda whom he has already told to stay away from Vivi. Ahin picks Vivi up, and it seems like Vivi is scared and just about to cry. While they were having a cute conversation, Ash quickly comes off and bites Barra, taking revenge from Vivi's side. This is where Ahin reveals that both Barra and Ash are quite close to each other, so it's okay even if they fight like actual beasts. Ahin tells Vivi that since Ash is always with her, Barra might have become jealous and decided to eat her. Vivi then starts arguing with Ahin that he should spare Barra, to which Ahin is quite surprised that she can sense his bloodlust even though he didn't publicly announce that he was going to kill Barra. Ahin replies with a cold gaze that he can kill Barra if he does not follow his orders. Vivi starts getting sadder and sadder and finally asks Ahin that if she doesn't follow his orders, will he kill her too? He was taken aback by the turn of events and as a result, he chose to show mercy to Barra. Ahin then suggested she should take Barra under her wing since she technically saved his life. While it was a relief that Barra wasn't getting killed, Vivi was still scared of the big beast. After the incident, we see Rill coming out of the barn and he greets Ahin. Vivi wonders why Ahin is here since he should be at the temple right now. Ahin replies and says that he thought of Vivi and came. Ahin now reveals their level of security as there was a whole pack of panthers listening to them all this time. Vivi suddenly passes out from exhaustion and Ahin takes her home to rest together. Evelyn kept teasing Ahin while other servants were stunned to see how cute Vivi was. This was the first time everyone was seeing a girl brought by the young lord himself. Evelyn and Ahin talk about the fact that security needs to be stronger around Vivi since she's been getting in so much trouble lately. He's right because first, she got kidnapped by Loon, and now Barra is about to attack her. Evelyn keeps bugging Ahin that if she becomes a full human, she might not remain here and want to return to her place. Suddenly, Vivi throws a punch that hits Ahin, but it is all in her sleep. Lady Valence sees the whole situation and calms all the workers down, who are in awe, looking at the fact that the young prince has brought a lady to his home for the first time. Now they are greeted by Maimie, and Ahin tells her she will be her escort as soon as she wakes up. The guards behind Maimie started gossiping about how Maimie was so calm after knowing that young master Ahin had brought a girl to the home. They then started again and said that Maimie might be calmer because she already knows the girl. Maimie got so angry that it shocked the guards and Ahin too. Now her nose started to bleed in anger, but she apologized. Upon waking up, the first thing Vivi notices is Mamie's nose bleeding, so she quickly asks about it. However, Mamie deflected the question by saying she had prepared a bath for Vivi. After Mamie is about to return, Vivi grabs her dress and tells her that it must have been a big shock for her to know her real identity. Mamie was honest with Vivi and explained that she wasn't avoiding her, but was surely a bit surprised. Vivi then hugs Mamie and is relieved that she doesn't hate her. As the girls were having their sweet moment, Ahin reaches out to them and asks what they are doing. Vivi then goes out to give Ash a snack and all the guards are surprised to see her again. They quickly asked her with their deep red eyes how they could help her and interestingly enough, she got scared once again and decided not to go outside, but just rest. As Sahin returns, he notices Vivi wrapped in a cozy blanket. He playfully teases her, wondering why she's all bunched up on the couch. Vivi then takes a sip of her tea, enjoying the sweet taste and thinking to herself how she can indulge in this delicious drink every day if she remains human. After a while, Ahin suggests that Vivi should come to bed if she's finished with her tea. Vivi becomes anxious at the thought, as this will be the first time they officially sleep together in bed. Now she looks stunned, unsure of what to do. Vivi simply rolls and leans on the sofa and says goodnight. As soon as she opens her eyes, she sees Ahin rolling over the bed in pain, and it seems like he's suffering a lot. However, it was all a play to get Vivi to come over to him. Vivi is now flustered, and Ahin takes her hand, bringing her closer to him. Ahin seemed to be in quite a playful mood, and as soon as Vivi told him that she was going to sleep on the sofa, he started to act like a cute little munchkin who looked pretty adorable. Despite his desire for Vivi to join him in bed, 
Payne decided to roll her into a separate blanket to prevent her pheromones from causing any unnecessary complications. He cautioned her not to touch him since it could potentially harm her. In response, Vivi inquired about Ahin's well-being, but he deflected the question and asked her about her transformation and the pain that comes with it. After a brief moment of awkwardness, Vivi persisted in chatting with Ahin and revealed that she had encountered his grandfather in the study. This prompted Ahin to speculate whether Vivi had employed her pheromones on his grandfather. He told Vivi that it would have been better if she had just kicked him with her hind legs. Afterwards, Ahin apologized to Vivi for taking her to a temple before. This gesture surprised Vivi as she didn't anticipate him apologizing. As they shared this heartfelt moment, Vivi requested if Ahin could set her free so she can feel more comfortable. After Ahin insisted on keeping Vivi wrapped up in the blanket, despite her saying she wouldn't touch him, they both finally went to sleep. However, things turned when Vivi woke up because she felt a tail touching her face, only to find a big black panther on the bed instead of Ahin. She briefly thought it could be Ash, but terrified remembered that Ash was sleeping in Mamie's room. Out of fear, she falls off the bed and crawls up to the farthest corner of the room, wondering who the panther is. Right then, Ahin's hawk taps against the window, and just as Vivi lets him in, he starts pecking her head. Trying to shove him off, she asks him if he knows who the panther sleeping in Ahin's bed is, only for him to smirk at her mockingly. As she's dealing with the bird, she catches sight of Ahin's robe discarded behind the sleeping panther and realizes that the panther is in fact Ahin. She slowly sneaks up to him and asks if he's okay. The panther does not answer her and she worries for his health since where humans don't revert to their animal forms unless something is wrong with their bodies. Just as she leaves to fetch Ivorin or a physician, he holds her hand by his tail, telling her not to leave. She asks him if he wants her to treat him instead, but he only turns away, implying that he doesn't want her to. Witnessing his foul mood, she turns away from him, declaring that either way, she doesn't really care whether he's sick or not. But her fickle resolve breaks just as quickly, and she starts petting him lovingly. The panther enjoys it at first, but then he wiggles his tail to remind her of their promise. Vivi shudders at the thought of her liver being taken by him before smacking his rear and calling him a wicked carnivore. She wonders why Ahin doesn't want anyone to know about his condition and guesses it's because he doesn't want rumors to spread. Recalling what the physician lady told her a few days ago about carnivores and their grief that causes conflicts, she wonders if it's because he might get attacked and killed while he's weakened by somebody who desires to attain his power and status. Carefully, she turns to Ahin and tells him that even though rabbits have their own conflicts over hierarchy, they don't kill each other for it. And so, even if he's weak, she cannot harm him in any way. Then she plops down on his bed and extends her arms to invite him to her loving embrace. He obediently complies, and despite fearing the size of the panther and their proximity, she holds him in her arms simply because it's Ahin. As she tenderly pats him, she apologizes for lying to him about not caring whether he's sick or not, and hopes that he's fine. As the night drifts away, the panther sleeps soundly in her embrace. The following morning, Vivi has reverted back to her rabbit form and is in the middle of a food battle with Ahin's foul hawk, Quinn. She headbutts him for ruining her precious hay, as Ivorin and Ahin watch them from a distance. Ivorin comments on how she has the skills of a legendary warrior for headbutting a difficult opponent like Quinn, and Ahin agrees with him. Just as that rabbit reclaims her territory, one of Ahin's manservants approaches her and asks if she needs assistance with anything. She remembers him from the library the day she put Ahin's grandfather to sleep and recalls stealing his clothes when she took on her human form. With watery eyes, she apologizes to him for leaving him bare on the cold hard floor, only for Ahin to accuse her of cheating on him again. Ivorin joins the bandwagon and brings back all the times she has run off with Lord Loon, implying that infidelity runs in her rabbit blood. With a gaze as cold as ice, Ahin reminds her that she promised him her liver last night and yet has the audacity to go behind his back like this. Just as she feels like he'll bite her as a punishment, he leaves a peck on her cheek instead, offering her to accompany him to work every day in exchange for the liver. Vivi only touches her cheek in surprise, blushing and wondering what just happened. 
Meanwhile, at the Ravian household, there are rumors of Avon, Vivi's mother's deteriorating mental health as she hasn't left her room in days and is mourning in silence. It is revealed that Vivi's brother, Carrie has lost his life to a fierce storm while carrying out some family business affairs. Avon lies in her room, clenching her fists and jaw, mourning his loss and wondering why he had to die despite being her golden child. She laments spending 20 years in a loveless marriage only so she could bear a child who would rise to power. Just as she laments at her misfortune, a maid walks in with news that their clan chief has confirmed that the chief of the panther clan has a pet baby rabbit. Furthermore, there's a possibility that the panther will be attending the rabbit chief's birthday party in a few days and bringing his rabbit along. Avon's ears perk up at the news and she wonders about the possibility of the rabbit being Vivi. Back at the Grace household, Ahin indulges his furious grandfather in a conversation about his beloved pet, telling him not to mistreat her again. The old man calls him an impertinent rascal who is still immature and doesn't know how to treat his grandfather whom he has met after months. Ayn calls him an old foggy and asks a servant to replace his bitter tea with sweet hot chocolate. His grandfather calls him a man who still hasn't acquired a taste for exquisite tea and reminds him of the code of conduct he has taught him over the years. Ahin comfortably answers that he's wise in his conduct, hides his emotions, doesn't let pride get to him, doesn't get scared in the face of death, and stays numb to his losses, just as he has been taught by him. The old man furiously slams his desk, criticizing his dignity and reminding him that he isn't paying heed to their clan's future. He doesn't even think about producing an hair, and for that reason, has broken his grandfather's heart. Ahin laughs and says he knew he would talk about that. His grandfather sighs and asks him where he found his rabbit, revealing that she used pheromones on him. He tells him six months ago, he discovered her at the border of the forest. Then he curiously questions what it means to bite someone's neck. As the grandfather watches him in disbelief, he reveals that the rabbit has bitten his neck and thus plans to devour him. Furthermore, she has even smacked his rear to tell him she's about to gobble him up. Right before leaving, he warns him not to mess with his rabbit again because she's too dangerous and may draw blood if something were to happen. As the old man yells and calls him an unhinged rogue who plays the old man for a fool, all the servants watch the mansion from afar, wondering about the ruckus. A few days later, as Vivi is keeping Madame Valence company at tea time, she expresses sorrow at the library incident with Ahin's grandfather and advises the rabbit to stay away from him for as long as he's staying at the estate. She tells her he isn't a bad person and that she shouldn't resent him for it, moreover, Ahin has already scolded him for his misconduct. Then the clan leader turns to her well-tamed panthers and wonders if they are following Vivi's lead because they are sensitive to her pheromones. Vivi notices how docile Vara is acting in front of Madame Valence, but bullies her when they are alone. She concludes it's because of his jealousy about Ash loving her instead of paying heed to him that he grounds her with his paws and shoves her aside every chance he gets. She decides to inform Madame Valence about this and acts it out in front of her, only for her to misunderstand it. The lady notices her distress and asks her to explain her worries to her again, and the rabbit wonders if she should ask her about a hen. She informs her about him turning into a panther and fainting in the middle of the night, only for her to mistake that she wants to learn how to tame panthers instead. She commends her on the thought and agrees that taming both Vara and Ash could prove to be very beneficial in terms of the rabbit's safety, while a disappointed Vivi lies numb and defeated on her cushion. By nightfall, Ahin returns to his room only to find a cardboard box placed before him. Vivi recalls how much Vara and Ash love to play with it, and since Ahin is a panther too, she has assumed he would like it too. But now as he tells her he isn't interested in cardboard boxes, she regrets her decision. Ahin accuses her of using cheap tricks to get him to submit to her now that she has seen his panther form, but happily reveals that he's down to be her pet for the night. Pissed at his childish attitude, Vivi decides to leave only to be picked up by Ahin, who comfortably snuggles in the box, making the rabbit wonder if he likes it after all. Ahin then gifts her a pocket watch studded with an expensive gemstone, the perineum. He reveals that this gemstone can help her with her pheromone seizures, making Vivi extremely happy. Seeing her happy face, he asks her if she needs the gemstone. She nods her head yes, 
making him question if she doesn't need him anymore, now that she has a stone to help her with the convulsions. Vivi profusely blushes at the question, wondering why he has to keep making her heart race as if she has run a marathon. Ahin then compares himself to the gemstone, counting how he's superior in terms of power and limits, and yet she never seems to need him as much as she needs the stone. Vivi realizes that he has noticed her awkwardness and mistrust, and wonders why she has been doubting his goodwill. Ever since she got to know about her healing pheromones, she has wondered if Ahin only kept her close because he wanted to use her ability. Regretting her actions, she extends her paws to him in hopes to convey that she does indeed need him. Wide-eyed at her gesture, Ayn tells her it's the first she has ever approached him without a hint of mistrust. Embarrassed, Vivi jumps out of his hand, but he catches up to her, placing a kiss on her back. Vivi blushes at the gesture and wonders what has gone wrong with the crazy panther. A few nights later, as a tired Vivi gets back home from work and complains about how much Ahin is burdening her with, Quinn flies in through the window. But this time, Vivi doesn't feel as scared since she has a secret weapon on her side, strawberries. She tames Quinn with his beloved strawberries and he happily devours them. A few moments later, the two watch over the mansion's lawn from the balcony only to find Ahin and Ivan going somewhere in a hurry. Vivi worries why Ahin isn't returning to his room instead, and Quinn notices it. He pushes her to hold onto his claw before taking flight without warning. As Vivi barely clings to him for dear life, she notices he's following after Ahin and possibly trying to pay her back for the strawberries. Meanwhile, inside the estate's prison, Ivrin informs Ahin of the last of the drug addicts they have in captivity and explains that the drug seems to have originated in the hyena territory and from there, was brought to the slums of Andalus. It excites a person's mood, or activates their pheromones, and in rare cases, may enhance a person's existing pheromones. Intrigued, Ahin questions, since aristocratic ranks are divided based on bloodlines, if a low-ranked noble family can produce healing pheromones, which are extremely rare. Ivorin answers that they would be unlikely even for a clan leader to possess. Ahin reveals that Vivi's pheromones are the heaving kind, but it isn't possible for her to be the clan leader's daughter, since if it were the case, they would have dealt with her on her own instead of abandoning her in the forest. Then he questions what would happen if a young werehuman were to be infused with these pheromone-enhancing drugs before they took their permanent human form. Ivorin guesses it would make their pheromones superior, and Ahin informs him that Vivi is tolerant of this drug, meaning that she was exposed to it as a child, implying that her parents were the ones behind it. Ahin then hears a soft rustle but brushes it off, thinking it's a rat, but it turns out to be Vivi who has heard the entire conversation. Right then, a prisoner starts mocking Ahin and tells him that he'll die an early death, just like his father. Ahin plays it cool at first, but uses his pheromones to make him cough up blood and succumb to the floor. As the panda walks away, he picks up on the stench of blood coming from himself. He confirms it with Ivorin and then starts taking off his robes, thinking about how Vivi would push him away if he goes back to his room smelling of blood. Ivorin mistakes his actions and warily declines when Ahin asks him to return to their chambers, thinking that he wants to sleep with him. Later, Ahin returns to his room and on his way, asks a few guards about what he smells like. He's conscious about it before meeting with Vivi, and although confused, the guards tell him he smells of certain spices. Relieved that it isn't blood, he walks into his room only to find it reeking of Vivi's pheromones. He recalls that it only happens when she's experiencing heightened emotions. Ahin calls out to her a few times before locating her curled up under a cupboard, shivering and crying. He calls out to her, but when she doesn't comply, he's reminded of his mother's words that the rabbit may rely on him someday, but will never fully trust him. Defeated, he lies down on the floor and asks her to come out whenever she's ready. The rabbit thinks back to what she has heard in the prison and recalls her mother's kind words to her. She would call her her beloved baby and express faith in her pheromones being superior to everybody else's. She wonders since the same lovely mother has betrayed her, where else is she supposed to go? As tears begin to fall, she slowly crawls up to Ahin, wondering how he manages to find her every single time. She questions if she ever disappears, will he be the only one who tries to find her? 
Vivi snuggles up to him with tears in her eyes, and Ahin smiles, pulling her close. Later, Vivi ponders over the entire story and fears as she goes on like this. Without ever knowing the truth from her parents directly, she will never be able to find the truth about her body. With that in mind, she vows to confront them as soon as possible. The next morning, as Ahin gets ready to head off to the rabbit territory on the occasion of the clan chief's birthday, Vivi sneaks into his pocket, but is eventually found out. She tries to persuade Ahin to take her with him, but he just leaves her with his servants. She performs acrobats, dances, pretends to be wounded, and even begs Ivorin to sneak her in his pocket, but none of her tactics work. Finally, she blocks the door for Ahin, and when he tries to shove her away, she squeezes his fingers, hoping to bribe him with her cuteness. But he pushes her aside and almost walks out of the door only for her to get in the way once more. She extends her arms and announces she'll jump into his embrace if he doesn't stop, making all the servants and Ahin blush. He picks her up and says how odd it is that she's clinging to him today to despite never showing interest in his comings and goings. Pulling her close, he asks her if he shouldn't leave at all. Knowing that she will have to give him what he wants if she wants to go with him, she nods her head. Ahin smiles and then commands Ivorin to grab onto her while he quickly leaves the room. Ivorin tells the disappointed rabbit that Ahin didn't plan on taking her with him since the beginning, making her blush and wonder if she put on her entire acrobatic show in vain. Outside the door, Ahin plops down on his knees and mumbles how Vivi's neediness almost pushed him over the edge. As he recovers and leaves, a soft blush and a tender smile decorate his face. On their way to their destination, Ivorin comments on how Ahin hasn't stopped smiling since they left the Grace Mansion. He says if he were to stay distracted like this, he should have brought Vivi with him. Ahin smiles as he ponders over how needy Vivi was, and if he had known this, he would have started pretending like he was leaving for a long journey a few days earlier. Disturbed by his cheeky expression, Ivorin states the obvious that she may have known they were going to the rabbit territory, and thus her desperation. Ahin agrees with him, saying that it's possible that she missed her home. As the carriage moves on, he ruminates on his decision, thinking that he has done the right thing since the path to their destination is long and subject to ambushes. Given her unstable pheromones, it was better to leave her behind. But deep down, he knows that he did it only because he's too afraid of her disappearing right before his eyes again and returning home to her rabbit parents. Meanwhile, at the Grace Mansion, Vivi tries to escape with her panther pair only to be pursued by Mamie and the castle guards. Just as they jump off the fences, Quinn grabs the rabbit and struggles to make up his mind about whether to toss her into Mamie's hands or help her get over the fences. In the end, he topples over and ends up in Lord Lillian, Hen's grandfather's grasp. The old man commends Vivi on her bravery, and when Mamie tries to get hold of the rabbit, he uses his pheromones to drain her energy. The castle guards next to her faint too, but Vivi doesn't feel a thing, wondering if he precisely directed the chemicals away from her. He recalls their last encounter at the library where she attacked him with her pheromones and made him fall asleep. He questions her identity, acknowledging that she understands human speech and also uses pheromones. Asking if she's a member of the rabbit clan, he earns a nod from her, something that prompts him to let her go. He puts her back on Ash's back and says that she needs to be close to Ahin all the time since he needs her. As the group runs off, Lord Lillian cages Quinn out of fear that he'll try to stop the rabbit in her tracks. Madame Valence asks him why he let her go, and he simply answers that it felt like she really wanted to be with Ahin. The lady laughs and teases him that he's trying to make up for his misconduct with Vivi at the library. He curtly denies it and reveals that he only wants to frustrate his grandson a bit. Madame Valence decides to send a messenger bird to Ahin to inform him of Vivi's anticipated arrival. Since he didn't want to take her with him, which is rare, his mother assumes there was a reason behind it. She uses one of the papers that Vivi has previously worked on and sends a messenger owl to deliver it to her son. Meanwhile, just outside the Panther's territory, Vara prepares to attack Vivi. According to Madame Valence, it's because he doesn't consider her to be higher than him on the hierarchy and thus won't succumb to her as his master. Vivi is immediately kicked off of Ash as the two engage in a fierce fight. Vivi worries that they both might get seriously injured and decides to use her pheromones to stop them. 
Right then, a familiar voice tells her to aim her pheromones like an arrow shot at the opponent. Turning around, she's surprised to find Loon with a scratched face smiling at her. He explains that it's his sister's fault, but rightfully so since he was lazing around instead of heading to the rabbit chief's birthday banquet. Focusing on the problem at hand, Vivi tries to aim her pheromones at the two leopards using the same technique as Lord Lillian, but dramatically fails. It makes Vara notice her, and as he runs toward her with bloodthirst in his eyes, Vivi yells at him to stop while successfully releasing her pheromones at him. The panther falls fast asleep, and Loon praises her skill. Then he asks her where she's headed and guesses that she's chasing after a hin. She nods her head vigorously, but he tells her that Ahin has taken a detour to avoid meeting him, and she's currently at the far opposite of the route he has taken. As Vivi watches him in disbelief, he smiles and offers her a ride, saying that it only makes sense since they are headed to the same destination. In Loon's carriage, he asks Vivi if all the rabbits like eating carrots, revealing that he loves meat, being a lion. As he chews on his favorite jerky snack, he mentions that the rabbit territory is unusually peaceful, and since she was found near this area, she must have been kidnapped by a hen. He asks her to wiggle her tail if it's true, but she only glares at him and wonders why she's been wary of a lethargic, unbothered person for so long. Then the distress of his right-hand man meets Vivi's ears as he struggles to disguise Ash as a pet cat. He laments how huge she is, and no matter how hard he tries, she still looks like a hulking predator. Vivi gestures to Ash to give him a taste of her hulking physique, and he hits the man, making the carriage distort on its way. By nighttime, Ahin has reached his destination and is working at his desk tirelessly. Ivorin asks him to rest up, but he insists on working, making Ivorin tease him about looking out the window every other minute. He guesses the panther is waiting for a message from the rabbit and offers to hold on to it if it arrives while he sleeps. Ahin says he doesn't want to sleep alone, so he offers to sing him a lullaby, only for Ahin to call him tone deaf. As Ivorin complains, Ahin wonders if he'll be okay tonight, sleeping without Vivi, since he won't receive help from her healing pheromones. Right then, Lady Valence's messenger bird arrives with a letter from Vivi, calling Ahin a nutcase. He smiles and writes a reply for her, before sending it off with the bird. Meanwhile, Loon's carriage arrives at the clan chief's estate. The estate guards try to hold Ash off for being a carnivore, but Loon snivels that he can't bear to stay away from his pet panther, who is almost like a daughter to him. After a bit more struggle, they manage to sneak both the rabbit and the panther inside. At night, as Vivi practices some peculiar moves to aim her pheromones, Loon asks her why she's exercising in the middle of the night. He suggests that the two of them rest up for the night, since it's late and Vivi wonders why he treats her like a person every time they meet. Turning around to face her on the couch, he expresses joy at the fact that a hen's scent has almost completely dissipated from her and Vivi feels a chill run down her spine at the thought of having her pheromones exposed. The lion then mentions how she's still so wary around him despite him trying his hardest to make her trust him. Vivi blames his insincere expression for it and Loon mentions how it has always got him into trouble. Then he starts speaking nonsense about how his sister is a tyrant and Vivi mentions how weird it is to see Loon without his guard up. He mumbles half asleep, finally understanding why Ahin covers the rabbit with his pheromones, blaming her flowing pheromones for making him dizzy. Vivi senses his own pheromones running wild, and since he's from a powerful bloodline, she mentions how strong his pheromones are. Fearing that she might turn human, she tries to tell him to control himself by dancing, a gesture that Ahin has taught her. But expectedly, he doesn't understand it and calls her a ballerina instead. Panicking, Vivi reaches for the perineum in her backpack right before everything goes blank. In the morning, Ahin finds himself at a drug merchant's shop disguised with his face hidden behind dark robes. Upon being interrogated, the drug merchant says he can't reveal sensitive information, but he can tell him which families in the rabbit territory have dealt with the pheromone-enhancing drug. Ahin specifies that the families have to be from mid-aristocratic ranks and must possess white hair. As the merchant gives him a narrowed-down list of the suspected family names, Ahin stiffens at the mention of the Ravian family. The next morning, a dizzy Vivi wakes up to some rabbit children looking at her from a distance. They whisper about how she's awake, 
has the characteristic violet rabbit clan eyes and is half naked. As she fully wakes up, she notices herself draped in sheets and in her human form. Ash is crawling up behind her, and she wonders if it's her who took her out of Loom's rooms since she can't recognize the one she's inside at the moment. She playfully pats Ash's head, and she lovingly licks her, making the children shudder in fear. Noticing them, Vivi wonders how she should get out of this awkward situation. She begins narrating the story of her matchless bravery against the ferocity of a three-headed chimera. She explains how the chimera's persistent pursuit behind her led to their encounter and thus, a fierce battle commenced between them that even if she won, destroyed all of her armor and rendered her in the disheveled state that she was in when they first saw her. The children easily buy it and push her to tell her more. Impressed with her powerful feats, they start calling her Miss Warrior and promise to not reveal her secret to anyone while she's carrying out her top secret mission. Happy that she didn't get herself into trouble, Vivi stands up and stretches her body before looking out of the window. Much to her surprise, she finds Ahim getting out of his carriage and she wonders if she should go and say hi to him. Immediately though, she discards the thought, worried about how the Ravian family would treat her if their paths cross. She doesn't want Ahin to see her being mistreated. Just as the thought crosses her mind, Ahin looks up at her, and she immediately ducks down to hide, wondering if he has eyes on his forehead too. As she hides her blushing face behind her hands, one of the children notices a scratch on her hand and takes her to his physician mother to get treated. Meanwhile, as Ahin arrives at the mansion, the first person he meets is the worried Warilian. Loon is in panic, looking for the disappeared rabbit, and in the midst of it all, seeing Ahin only ruins his mood. Just as they are about to clash with each other, the rabbit children turn up on the scene. They recall Miss Warrior's remarks about how lazy the lions are and how flippant and foolish the panthers are. The carnivores wonder about who this Miss Warrior is before Ahin flaunts his fangs and makes the children run away out of fear. When Ivorin scolds him for painting a bad image of the panthers, he reminds him how Vivi plays dead when he shows her his fangs. It reminds Loon of his initial mission, and he sprints away, searching desperately for the rabbit. Meanwhile, Pen feels unease over being separated from Vivi and wonders how she's doing. Meanwhile, Vivi meets the physician who turns out to be the woman who treated her during her previous pheromone seizure. As she treats Vivi's scratch wound, she introduces herself as a professor teaching at the prestigious Wilhelm Academy, Vensi Ganana, a were capybara. She also tells her that the little boy who brought her here is her son Russell. As Vivi begins to introduce herself, she struggles to reveal her family name. Right then, Russell takes over and calls her a warrior instead, a warrior who can break a boulder in two. His mother finds it interesting that he's interacting with a stranger despite being shy and accredits it to her pure aura. She reveals that her son has a unique pheromone that helps him discern other living creatures' auras, something that is a bit difficult for a were capybara to handle. She also explains that because of this rare ability, Russell took on his permanent human form a bit late and tends to be careless and clumsy, just like Vivi. Hearing these words makes Vivi suspicious, and she defensively asks her how she knows of her identity. Ash catches up on it and backs her up, roaring into the physician's face. She instantly picks up Russell in defense and asks Vivi to calm down the panther. Vivi realizes how herbivore werehumans are scared of the canines and asks Ash to step down, only for her to playfully bite her hand. Despite trying to play it cool, Vivi eventually faints out of fear. Once Vivi gets better, she shares some tea with a physician who reveals that she was looking into her son's condition when she met Vivi for the first time. She noticed that Vivi had a rare pheromone and was equally as clumsy as her son and wondered if the same was the case with him. She mentions how long Vivi's hair is, simply because she hasn't had a haircut all her life, and secondly, she mentions hearing the rumors about Irving Grace raising a pet rabbit. She matched all the dots and concluded that Vivi was indeed a late-blooming were-rabbit. Vivi wonders if she knew Ahin when they first met, and the doctor says that he remembered her from an encounter they had back when he was a child. Moreover, his grandfather is the dean at the academy she teaches at, so they are fairly acquainted. Suddenly, the bells ring, reminding the guests that the banquet is only a few hours away, 
Vivi wonders if this is the only time she will ever get to meet with her parents and have a conversation with them in her human form. She turns to Vensi and with her gleaming puppy eyes, requests that she dress her up for the event. As night befalls and the guests start arriving at the banquet, Vivi sneaks through the estate's gardens. She stops in her tracks when she senses a familiar presence following her and asks Loon to show himself. When he does, she reveals she's aware that he has listened to her entire conversation with Professor Ginana too. He apologizes for it and with a soft smile crossing his lips, says that he's been following her because he's worried she might disappear once again if he doesn't. Loon asks her to let him accompany her to the banquet, but she turns him down since she can't meet up with her parents with a carnivore by her side. Then Loon rants about how she's been ungrateful to his kindness all along and reminds her how he has helped her and Ash sneak into the rabbit estate. Although she's a bit thrown off at first, she softly walks up to him and reminds him that she has healed the scratch on his face already. Thanking him for always treating her like a person, she smiles, but as she begins to walk away, he grabs her hand. He tries to say something but when he fails, he lets her go, wishing her luck on the secret mission that she's carrying out without telling even a hen. At the same time, En receives news from the estate that Ash and Vivi have left and are nowhere to be found. He immediately decides to head back, but Ivorin tells him it'll be in vain since those two aren't at the estate and must be somewhere else. Furthermore, the rabbit is strong and has Ash with her, so she should be fine. But Akin can't help but feel immensely worried, for the rabbit is still a rabbit at the end of the day. A frail and weak rabbit. Right then, the rabbit children from before show up and ask Ahin if he's crying. He's reminded of when they mentioned a Miss Warrior and begins interrogating them. One of the children reveals that it's a were-rabbit who orders around a black panther, but Russell gets there just in time to seal his mouth. But as Ahin already has the information he needs, he quickly leaves to find the damned Warelian. On the other hand, Vivi struggles to sneak into the estate building and tries to jump off the fences, only to end up stumbling. Right then, a familiar voice asks her if she's okay. Flashbacks begin to stir her memory, and her mother's voice fills her head. She turns to face the woman standing in front of her, and much to her surprise, she instantly recognizes her as her daughter. She quickly embraces her, saying how much she has missed her. Vivi is moved to tears at how kindly she's treating her and wonders if it would've been better had she shoved her away like she used to. Pushing her away, Vivi sternly asks why she was abandoned in the forest. When her mother hesitates to answer, she explains it herself. For a child who couldn't turn into a human, Rumors were flying around the rabbit clan that Avon has had an extramarital affair that led to Vivi's birth. To put an end to those rumors, the priest declared her cursed and paved the way for her mother to abandon an aristocrat's child easily, without fearing legal consequences. Vivi reveals that she knows the priest is her relative and must have made up the entire story about her being cursed to help her find a way to abandon her own unwanted child. Avon notices how stern and brave her daughter seems now, contrary to how meek she has always been. Comparing her to her late son and deeming her superior, she vows to bring her back into the family in hopes that she'll lead the clan one day, given her attributes. She begins by explaining that she left her in the forest because she was weak compared to other children and the family had to maintain its image. Expressing regret over her decision, she reveals how she's been looking for her and hoping that she would return. Vivi discards her claim and tells her she's grateful that she got abandoned because otherwise, she wouldn't have attained her human form, revealing that her pheromones are far superior to have been passed down to her in her low-ranked aristocratic family. She questions her mother if she ever drugged her as a child. The lady stays quiet and looks away, confirming Vivi's suspicion. As she cries over the fact that she has lived her entire life as a rabbit because of her mother's greed, a fire breaks out in the building right next to her. Vivi shields her mother from it and immediately asks her to leave and get to a safe place as soon as her guards arrive. Avon holds her by the hand and asks her to come with her so they can talk about everything. She blames her for being a rabbit all her life and thus killing the opportunity for them to hold a conversation. But Vivi sternly asks her to let go of her hand and declares that she will not leave with her. Furthermore, she blames her disinterest in her daughter for the reason why they could never have the chance to talk anything out, not her being a rabbit. 
Unimpressed, Avon orders her guards to seize the girl at once, even if it means knocking her out. Vivi understands that she doesn't stand a chance against two trained knights and will most definitely be knocked out and captured before she even gets the chance to use her pheromones. Right before she decides to surrender, Quinn and Ash attack the two knights and the girl gains the upper hand. Furious, Lady Avon orders her guards to seize her at once even if they have to use their pheromones. They reveal that their pheromones might hurt her and cause her damage, but she orders them to go on with it anyway. Vivi watches her in horror and is worried about why her mother is going to such lengths to reclaim her now of all times. As the knights begin approaching her, Vivi decides to use her pheromones to put them to sleep despite the fact that she'll revert to being a rabbit once she does so. As she holds out her hand and channels her energy, Ayn gets there just in time to stop her. Holding her hand from behind, he tells her he prefers that she stays human for a while longer. When she asks him how he knew she was here, he intertwines their fingers and turns to the knights instead, warning them to sheathe their swords if they value their lives. Defeated, the Ravian family decides to comply with it, but before Lady Avon leaves, she tells Vivi that she's all that's left for her. Vivi tries to follow after her, but the fumes block her way and Ahin tells her it's not the right time. Back inside the mansion, Ayn asks Vivi to talk to him, but she shuts the door in his face. He wonders what she's doing but sighs and asks her to just talk to him through the door if that's what she wants. As the two settle down with their backs to the door, Vivi worries that she can't face him right now. Ayan asks her what happened to her hand. She weakly smiles and praises him for noticing something so trivial in the midst of all the chaos, before saying that it's probably a scratch from when she turned human. She beams at how kind he is, and how concerned his words are, making her wonder why she keeps expecting more and more from him. Ayan reveals that he left her at the Grace residence because he had no idea she would resort to something so reckless since she's the one who knows best that no place is safe for her. Once she leaves those premises, he has expected her to stay put. Vivi ruminates on how even his scoldings are just a masked expression of his worry, but mumbles that she'd do the exact same thing if the situation were to repeat itself, only because he's the one who never tells her anything. She cries that he never told her about her healing pheromones and that she acquired them from a drug. Wide-eyed, Ayan asks her how she knows about it and begs her to open the door so they can talk it out. She questions why he thinks she came all the way here without informing him, saying that it's because she didn't want him to see the depths of her dark past, the curse, the drugs, and even her family. Even a few moments ago, he did not ask who those people were and must have already known she belongs to the Ravian family and that the woman from before was her mother. Ahin continues to ask her to open the door, but she mumbles on, saying that he must have kept her with him because of her healing pheromones. And as long as she's useful, she won't have to be anxious about being abandoned again. She says he should have just told her about everything from the beginning, but he curtly declines it, saying that he has no intentions of telling her anything even in the future. She doesn't say anything but feels relieved that he didn't give her a heartless answer just now, wondering why this honesty of his makes her feel more and more nervous around him every day. She stays there for a few more hours, quiet as the dead of the night, before realizing how late it is. Regretting lashing out at Ahin, she decides to apologize to him in the morning for making him worry, before she heads out of the room to rest up in her room. But she's surprised to find Ahin still sitting at the door, when she asks him if he's asleep, he sways and crashes on the floor, burning up a fever. Panicking, Vivi asks him to wake up, but doesn't understand what else to do. She decides to find Professor Kyunana, but Ahin holds her by the hand and asks her not to make a fuss. When she doesn't understand him, he assures her he'll get better on his own. She recalls that time when he turned into a panther and asks if he told anyone about his condition back then. When he doesn't answer, she scolds him for not telling even Ivorin, only for him to weakly mumble that no one can know. Vivi doesn't understand why he wants to keep it a secret, even from the trustworthy Ivorin and even a physician, despite suffering so much. Brushing off the fort, she decides to help him with her own power. First off, she decides to shelter him from the cold hallway and lay him on a couch, but the plan miserably fails due to her frail muscles. Then she begins to pull a hen towards the bed by his legs, 
and although it seems to work initially, she accidentally bumps his head against a vase. Finally, she supports him while he walks on his own toward the bed. Pulling the sheets to cover him completely, she asks him if he needs anything but Ahin only smiles weakly and says he thought she hated him. Vivi carefully looks at him while brushing his hair away from his forehead and whispers that she wouldn't. Despite her best efforts to keep him warm, his fever continues to get worse. Not knowing what else to do, she decides to get him out of his uncomfortable clothing. The first thought that strikes her is how Ivorin and Ahin himself would tease her about it later and call her lewd and naughty. But she sets those thoughts aside, reminding herself of the fact that she has been living with him for months, so it doesn't matter if she takes off his jacket. She successfully removes the vest and coat but gets stuck unbuttoning his shirt. Ahin offers her help and teases her for having a naughty gleam in her eyes, despite pretending to be all meek and shy, making her fluster. As Ahin removes his gloves and unbuttons his shirt, Vivi sits there crying, wondering why he's sick, and if she can help him with her pheromones despite him not being injured. Ahin asks her why she's crying all of a sudden, and wipes away her tears, before mentioning how easily she cries as if it's her hobby. He asks how he could tell her about her family since all she would do is cry. Touching her face, he calls her tender-hearted and questions how he could ever abandon somebody like her. As he wipes away her tears, Vivi is reminded of the stories her maids have told her in her childhood, the ones about a black panther whose dazzling scarlet eyes will enchant and devour her one day, without her noticing. Thinking about how beautiful a hen's eyes are, she wonders how not to be captivated by them. To keep herself from being devoured, she covers his eyes with her hand, calling him a wicked carnivore. She soon starts sensing a hen's pheromones seeping out of his body and questions if he's having a pheromone seizure. He only smiles weakly at her. Vivi advises him to revert to his animal form since that would lessen the pain, but he completely ignores her. She then recalls Lord Lillian asking him to help Ahin and concludes that her pheromones may be able to help him. But as soon as she exudes them, Ahin tells her to stop, explaining that he doesn't want her to revert to her human form. Skeptically, Vivi whines about how he can't make up his mind, saying that he likes her better as a rabbit sometimes and sometimes the complete opposite. She tries to explain that she won't revert to a rabbit if Ahin modulates her unstable pheromones with his strong ones, but he refuses to listen. Seeing him panting in pain, she decides to take matters into her own hands. Hovering on top of him, she starts gnawing at his neck, hoping to mimic how Ahin infuses his pheromones into her by biting her neck, but soon realizes that it won't work since she lacks fangs. Ahin asks her what she's trying to do and out of embarrassment, she quickly tries to brush him off, but he grabs her by the hand and pulls her into a kiss. Blushing profusely, she calls him a wicked carnivore while his seizure settles down while they share their deep kiss. In the morning, the rabbit clan leader indulges in her tea while recalling how much of a pleasure it was to drink hot chocolate with Ahin Grace a few mornings back. But her maid mentions that while she meets Ahin today to investigate the explosion, they will only be served black tea. She further mentions the anonymous report they have received from Lady Avon about an unknown rabbit trespassing the territories while being accompanied by Ahin himself. The clan leader wonders how Lady Avon even got her hands on this report in the first place, implying her involvement with the fire. As she stands up and looks out of her glass window, she mentions how grateful she is to the one who put on the explosion display on her birthday, but since it could have been involved with a greater conspiracy, she deems further investigation necessary, smiling and mentioning that this birthday of hers is going to be like none other. Vivi wakes up in the morning in a completely disheveled state, relieved to still be human. She checks up on Ehin and is glad to find his fever's gone down. She watches him with a vulnerable look on her face, wondering when he crumbled the solid sand castle of her heart like a sweeping ocean wave. She admits that she has tried to keep the difference in their statuses, the polarity between their clans, and her current condition in her mind, and realizes that she cannot stay with Ahin for too long, especially in this kind of relationship. Recalling how even the frog prince in fairy tales only wins over the princess after he becomes a human, she sighs at her current reality. She recalls the events of last night, sitting in Ahin's bed in her unkempt state, and grieves his suffering. 
Looking over at him, she is utterly shocked to find out the hickey mark she has left on his neck. Panicking, she imagines how the banquet guests would speculate about his indecent and passionate lover if they ever catch sight of it. Determined to keep it from happening, she grabs his collar and decides to use her healing pheromones to treat the bruise. But as she rejoices at her useful ability, Ahin's piercing gaze sends shivers down her spine now that he's awake. He immediately reminds her of her promise to him a few nights ago that she won't touch him when he sleeps. A flustered Vivi tries her best to explain the situation to him, only to make him laugh in the end. Later, Vivi enjoys her breakfast, while wondering how considerate Ahin has been to pick up a menu that suits her clumsy table mannerism. As soon as she's about to indulge in her toast, Ash requests to be fed with her sparkly, innocent eyes. Defeated, she gives in and offers her bread to the panther, only to make Ahin ask her to feed herself first. Then he mentions how despite being fed so much in her rabbit state, so much so that she became as plump as a ball, Vivi's mass didn't get transferred when she took her human form. Flustered at being called a plump ball, she almost calls him a damned carnivore only for a hint to smile and mention how the phrase makes his heart flutter. He asks her to say it again, but she completely ignores him and continues to eat. Later, he questions how she arrived at the rabbit estate in the first place, and although she's a bit nervous, she reveals that the lion helped her. She mentions him sneaking both her and Ash into the estate, and her staying his room for the night, making Ahin instantly furious. He asks her to go on, but she says that's all there is to it. He wonders if it's the truth, mentioning how she's been reeking of the lion's scent since he met her yesterday, and Vivi recalls the time he held her arm in the rear garden. Then it hits her, and she asks if his petty jealousy is the reason why he kept holding her arm during his seizure episode last night. He doesn't deny it, and Vivi sighs, reminding herself of the anxiety she felt last night before facing her parents, and how it was relieved after she met Loon, wondering if it was perhaps the effect of his pheromones. Right then, Ivorin enters the room and summons a hin to a meeting called by the clan chief. He immediately declines, saying that he's currently busy arguing with the rabbit lady. Ivorin asks what's the matter only for a hin to dramatically complain that she has cheated on him with the lion once again. Vivi's mouth gapes at the accusation, and she tries to explain it's a misunderstanding but Ivorin doesn't buy it. Along with Ahin, he calls her a commendable cheater with deceiving puppy eyes. Ahin laments that she's already shamelessly glaring at him like always, trying to downplay the fact that she has cheated again. Ivorin hops on the bandwagon and advises him to prepare himself for a rocky future since her shamelessness will become hard to bear, calling it a characteristic of cheaters. As the panthers cry of their broken hearts, Vivi sits there frozen in silence, astounded at their frivolousness. During the meeting, Loon and Ahin argue in front of all the guests, bickering at each other with Miss Warrior's words. Then the host announces that a witness has been received regarding the fire that broke last night and a suspicious were-rabbit that was found on the scene. When they decline to reveal the identity of the witness, Ahin and Loon team up to argue about how unethical it is to summon guests from foreign territories and investigate them about doubtful accusations. The host assures them that the source of the information comes from the clan chief herself and explains that according to the report, the suspicious were-rabbit that was found near the fire was later seen with Ahin and that she is currently residing with him too. Moreover, she has also been linked to Lord Loon, since the two of them were spotted together in the rare garden, but what doesn't add up is that there is no record of such a rabbit entering the estate through the main gates. As Ahin struggles to come up with an explanation, Loon reveals that the were-rabbit is actually a dancer for whom both Ahin and himself have deeply fallen. Ahin is surprised at the claim, but plays along due to the lion's persuasion, Initially, he scolds him for calling her a mere dancer and for sneaking her into the rabbit estate. Loon stresses that it isn't him who brought her with him, but her who asked her to come along. They remind each other of all the times that they've tried to pull each other's legs whenever the rabbit was involved before Ahin scolds him for sneaking the rabbit's panther guard with him into the estate too. In turn, Loon calls him an idiot for assigning the panther to guard her in the first place. Meanwhile, the guests wonder if that infamous rivalry and dislike for each other has always been because of their mutual love interest, the now infamous Rabbit Dancer. 
As the argument gets serious, Loon says that the rabbit would have never followed after him as she trusted Ahin in the first place. A frozen Ahin clenches his fist before telling him to mind his own business and carry on with his lazy and apathetic existence precisely like he was raised to so that he wouldn't attempt to take his sister's authority away from her. Before things become even more heated, the clan leader intervenes and welcomes the rabbit dancer in his mansion as Ahin and Loon's esteemed guest and mentions that until they get to the bottom of the cause of the fire, she can stay in the mansion. As the evening sun sets in, Avon is in her carriage wondering about the day she left Vivi in the forest and mentions how today's just as cold as that day. She recalls that since her name was never entered in their family register, she won't have any authority to bring her back to her family if she crosses over to the Panther territory. As her carriage leaves, she vows to bring her back no matter the cost, while Vivi watches her from her window. She wonders why she can't fully love or hate her and compares it to her physical condition of varying from rabbit to human, almost like a staggering boat. She defeatedly smiles and calls herself a hollow shell with nothing significant inside. Ivran's voice immediately disagrees with the claim, calling her a chock full of goodies inside. He's tied up on the couch and questions when she will be untying him, mentioning how his blood supply is being cut off. She asks him why he even let her tie him up in the first place, and he blames her passionate expression and enthusiasm for it. Just as she complains about being called Lady Rabbit in her human form, Russell arrives and mentions that there's something very strange about the were-panther. Ivorin overhears him and calls himself a very ordinary panther, expressing his disappointment at the accusation. Vivi agrees that he's weird and says that he must be sensing bad energy from him. Russell whispers that, on the contrary, he isn't sensing any energy from the panther at all. Skeptically, Vivi looks over at Ivorin and senses a strange darkness looming over him. He lifts his head and his chilling gaze sends shivers down her spine as he commends them for discovering his secret. He reveals that he can sense things that others can't and right now, he can sense an ominous energy lurking behind Vivi. Shivering in fear, Vivi holds onto Russell and tells Ivorin to quit joking, only to find Russell shivering in fear too after glancing at her back. He mumbles that the energy behind her is very dark and scary, and Vivi wonders if all her life has been unlucky because of this energy, while the two of them tremble in fear. While Vivi wonders about Ivorin's identity, a voice whispers behind her that it's only natural that the capybara can't sense Ivorin's energy since he isn't susceptible to pheromones weaker than him. It turns out to be a hin who catches Vivi as she faints from her fear of ghosts. As he lays her in his bed, he wonders how she made it all the way to the rabbit territory despite being such a scaredy cat. He scolds Ivorin for making fun of her and questions why he's tied up. He reveals that Vivi tied his frail existence because she was fishing for information regarding Ahin's whereabouts. He later asks him how much he can reveal if similar events were to take place in the future, and Ahin allows him to tell her everything except that he carried a rabbit doll when he was a child. He then asks Ivorin to prepare a carriage for himself and Vivi to return to the panther territory. As Russell whines over being separated from the rabbit, Ahin says that she needs to get back to protect the panther territory and that he'll allow him to spend the rest of the day with her while she's here. In the evening, Vivi sits in the rabbit garden all alone, annoyed and wondering why none of the rabbits are attracted to her while they clearly are attracted to Ahin and Russell. Sighing, she asks Ahin if it is okay for her to move around in the castle like this, implying the current speculations going on against her. Ahin replies that she can do it without worry since she is his and Loon's guest. Then he recalls Loon calling her a dancer and Vivi blushes, thinking about the embarrassment of dancing in front of him in her rabbit form. Clearly unhappy, Ahin says she hides a lot of things from him too, but before she can explain anything to him, Russell gets into the picture. He asks Ahin to show him his fangs, and when he does so, the boy feels endlessly delighted. Vivi mentions how she has never seen Russell smile and Ahin be so obedient before and lets out a heartfelt chuckle. It catches both their attention and Russell calls her pretty. Ahin agrees with him, saying that the boy has a discerning eye that will help him gain a higher position on the hierarchy in the future. The statement sends Vivi down a spiral of thoughts and she wonders if Ahin thinks she's pretty too. 
It hurts her to think that he will, inevitably, one day get married and bear children, and it's about time that he gets engaged to someone, someone from a distinct aristocratic family from the Panther clan, or maybe from another carnivore family. But she's damn sure it won't be a herbivore like her. Right then, a rabbit climbs into her lap and nibbles on her clothes, making a hin question if she's communicating with the rabbit, being a rabbit herself. She says she cannot, and before he raises another question, she reveals that she can't communicate with rabbits in her rabbit form either. Ahin is surprised to see her understand his mind so well and laughs out loud, making Vivi's heart flutter and affirm that she doesn't want anyone by his side except for her. Vivi notices a light scratch on his face and wonders where he got it from. She flashes back to her morning maneuvers of trying to get rid of the bite mark on his neck and wonders if she scratched him back then. Ahin holds her hand and says that if it bothers her so much, she should just heal him. She reveals that she'll turn back into a rabbit if she does that, and wonders if he's fine with it. Ahin curtly denies it and affirms that he is not fine with it whatsoever. But then he leans against her shoulder and whispers that it doesn't matter to him whether she's in her rabbit or human form so she can go on ahead and do whatever she likes. Embracing her tightly, he tells her what she absolutely cannot do is disappear on him without a word since it wears out his patience. She explains that it happens because she gets scared in situations that are frightening and runs away before thinking things through, but she'll try not to disappear. He tells her she can't fly away either, and she shivers at the fact that he knows about her and Quinn's little venture into the Grace Estate prison. Ian then joyously declares that the lion's stench is gone from her, now that he's holding her, and tells her she smells like sweet potatoes. She finds it strange and recalls Loon, telling her she smells like butter, and wonders why these carnivores are so weird. She leans into a hin and reveals that she has something important to tell him as soon as they return to his room. When he teases her about how lewd she's becoming, she unveils that it's about why she came here from the Panther territory and whatever transpired while she stayed here, saying that she just somehow wants to tell him everything. He sincerely smiles before whispering that he's looking forward to it. Later in the morning, a hen's man servant, Yuan, enters his room only to find Vivi and Ash subdued on the couches in silence, while Ahin flips through a newspaper in utter comfort. He tells the worried Yuan that they just argued about something and that he need not worry about Vivi's current dejection. Then he turns to Vivi and tells her to put a cape around her shoulders or if she's so keen on crying and protesting, she should do so in front of the fireplace. When she doesn't budge, he asks Yuan to go to the kitchen. He wonders if he needs a quick snack, but Ahin advises him to just go and tell the chefs there that a rabbit in his custody has lost her will to live. Yuan is confused and wonders if he wants her to be used as an ingredient. Vivi's ears immediately perk up and she glares at the man before shifting to the fireplace, along with an obedient ash. Ahin turns to Vivi and asks her why she's so upset about leaving even though it has been decided since yesterday. Vivi glares at him and wonders how he could only tell her hours before the departure time that she's leaving and leave her without enough time on her plate to say her farewell to Professor Ginana. He explains that staying in a foreign territory without a proper identity is harmful to her and she strikes a nerve upon hearing the word foreign. Angrily, she stands up and drapes a cloak over her shoulders before curtly declaring that she's going out to say goodbye to the professor. Ahin offers to go together with her, but she coldly tells him he can't join a herbivore meeting. But right before leaving, she apologizes for being rude to him and reveals that she merely wanted to return home with him since they did not come together. As she vanishes from his view, a dazed Ahin absent-mindedly stares at the door. Meanwhile, walking down the hallways, Vivi expresses worry over Ahin's health and his pheromone seizures and doesn't want to leave his side. Right then, she senses some footsteps synchronizing with hers. As she begins running to keep herself from being followed, Loon pulls her into one of the rooms. He later reveals to her that the person following her is possibly a guard set up by a Hin since she's leaving today. Furthermore, he requests a moment of her time before she returns, revealing that he won't get to see or talk to her for a while once she leaves, a separation that'll make him pretty upset. Skeptical, she questions why it would make him sad, only for the flustered lion to stumble upon his words and reveal that she's been on his mind for a while. Moreover, 
He's regretful that she wasn't left in the lion territory, since if that was the case, he could've been the one to pick her up instead of Ehin. Sensing the awkwardness and looking at the time, Vivi decides to return to Ehin's room, only to be stopped by Loon, who asks her to run away with her. He expresses concern over Ehin's future as the clan chief and explains that despite having insurmountable power, clan leaders are almost always at risk of being attacked or assassinated, and worries that she might get swept into something dangerous if she stays with him. Moreover, he calls him deranged and a diabolical bastard, the part that Vivi also agrees with. Loon notices the bite mark on her neck and wonders if it's Ahin's doing before he offers a place for Vivi to stay, saying that if she's being kept with Ahin without her will, his doors are always open to let her in. The only problem is that she won't be able to escape once she steps back into the panther territory, implying that if she's willing to run away with him, now is the time. Vivi watches him with wonder and feels sorry for doubting his intentions earlier, affirming that this man merely feels worried about her. She apologizes to Loon and politely declines his offer, saying that if it wasn't for a hin, she would have died in the forest that night. She reveals just how much he has helped her all this time and how dependent she is on him. Moreover, she's worried about his health and cannot leave his side. She admits that a hin is hard to deal with, the people around him aren't all that lovely, and she's easily scared and uneasy, but she's willing to stay anyway, since Ahin needs her perhaps a lot more than she needs him. Loon wonders if she's showing her gratitude to Ahin, and ties up her cloak's undone ribbon for her, feeling envious of Ahin for the first time in his life. He reveals that he's been taught to give up on things all his life, and was thinking that giving up on her would be just as easy, but isn't. Right then, the door of their room flies open and an unknown, intimidating figure walks in. The person is revealed to be Quinn, who is revealed to be a whereabout. Glancing at his suspicious personality while sitting in her carriage, Vivi recalls reading an encyclopedia that whereabouts can easily switch between their animal and human form, are rebellious, spend their lives in pursuit of freedom, and rarely tie themselves to families. Russell arrives on the scene to bid farewell to the rabbit lady and calls Quinn a bad bird. Vivi quickly picks him up, and the two talk skill about Quinn while he fumes in anger. The rabbit clan chief arrives at the carriage and mentions how unusual it is to witness a werebird tied to family. She's accompanied by Vensi who adds that even among them, werehawks are particularly notorious for their difficult personalities, so to see Quinn inside a carriage of the Grace family is indeed a rare sight to behold. As Vivi wonders if they are a mere spectacle to entertain them, the clan leader greets herself as a regular old lady working at the estate. Vivi heartily meets with her enthusiasm, and the woman reveals that she has wanted to personally greet the woman who has shaken the hearts of two handsome youths. Embarrassed, Vivi tries to brush it off, but the woman wonders if she has chosen the panther since she's sitting in his carriage. As she denies it in a fluster, Ahin watches his chaotic carriage from afar. Russell leaves his postal address with Vivi and asks her to write to him before succumbing to tears in his mother's embrace. Vensi wonders if he feels connected to Vivi to be crying at their parting like this, something that he usually doesn't do. Vivi promises to write to him before turning to the clan chief and vigorously stating that she isn't the one who set the fire that night and the clan leader tells her not to worry. Then she asks Vivi if she knows what it means when a carnival leaves a mark on another's neck and the girl blushes while touching her bruised neck, recalling that Ahim left the said mark on her back in the rabbit garden. She asks the woman what it means, but she merely tells her to keep it hidden from Lord Lillian for he would be furious if he finds out. As they bid their farewells, Vivi wonders about the party she is returning home with. Quinn who seems keen on pecking her head to death and Ivorin woes. Sulking at the misfortune, she looks out of the window, only for a hen to approach the carriage and call her a puppy wet from the rain. She suggests he calls her a wet rabbit instead before questioning if he really isn't coming with them. He explains that he has some tasks to attend to which will take quite a while, but he'll try to return in a day. Whining at the statement, she tells him not to rush himself, and Ahin wonders if she's so keen on going home with him because she doesn't want to be with Ivorin and Quinn. She doesn't deny it, and Ivorin starts complaining about his shattered heart. To ease up the mood, Ahin teases Vivi 
that her rabbit ears are sticking out of her head, making her panic instantly. Then he says it isn't her ears that are sticking out, but her tail. As Vivi complains about his mischief, he apologizes to her about not being able to go back together. The gesture makes Ivrin drop everything he was holding, while Quinn and Ash watch the scene with their mouths agape. Brushing them off, Vivi turns to a hin and wonders why he bit her neck back in the rabbit garden, and if it means anything more than just a means to rewrite Pheromone's sense. Flashing a smile, he reaffirms that it does mean something and wonders why she left a mark on him without knowing. He tries to undo his shirt to find it and have her reminded, but she punches his face instead, flustered. She regrets it immediately and Ivrin's documents slip out of his hand again, while Quinn and Ash continue to watch the scene in utter horror. But Ahin seems unbothered, rather he seems turned on and asks her to hit him again. She shuts the window in his face instead and requests to move along while Ahin watches the leaving carriage from a distance. On their way home, Ivrin mentions how he has never seen a hin apologize to anyone before. Being the stern and prideful man that he is, he has never bowed before anyone either. Furthermore, now that he has seen him apologizing and bowing to somebody, he fears that if Lady Rabbit tries to leave him, she will most definitely be served as a breakfast salad. He reveals that she isn't the first animal that a hin has brought in. In fact, Quinn was brought in before her when he got severely injured during a clash with Vara. Vivi scorns how idiotic it was to fight a black panther for a mere hawk, and Ivrin agrees with her. He also tells that he was a bit surprised when Ahin brought her in, and even went as far as to keep her in his pocket and take her everywhere, despite casting Quinn aside in a couple of days. Vivi beams at the revelation and wonders if she's getting special treatment from Ahin. Right before Ivrin warns that she should have run away at the first chance she got, their carriage suddenly comes to an abrupt halt. As some masked and hooded bandits lurk outside of their carriage, Ivrin tells Vivi not to worry since the bandits will be taken care of and offers her to hide inside his hat in the meantime. Vivi hears a sound of battle, amidst which an unknown silhouette locks the door of their carriage from the outside. Vivi is skeptical about why Quinn isn't out there battling and is so obviously trying to protect her inside the carriage. Furthermore, she wonders why a carriage without Ahin Grace is being attacked in the first place, especially since it is still outside of the Panther's territory. As the realization hits her, she freezes in her spot, wondering if the bandits are after her after all, and if so, she fails to understand why. She deduces that it has to be someone with the authority to ambush a carriage heading to the Panther territory, someone who knows who she is and is aware of her abilities, and somebody who disregards her intentions and wants to take advantage of her. It could only be one person, Avon Ravian. She's then reminded of the panther's words right before she bid him farewell, and wonders what it was that he had to take care of. Just as she questions what might be coming down between those two, she takes off her shoe and shatters the carriage's window. Trembling in fear, she threatens both Quinn and Ivorin to stay away from her, and senses dominating pheromones in the air. She asks Ivorin why he's lying to her, and if Ahin is somewhere nearby, threatening to jump out of the window if he doesn't answer. Ivorin apologizes to her, and says he's been ordered to stay quiet, so he cannot inform her about Ahin's whereabouts. Just as the two are bickering back and forth, Quinn pulls out his dagger and reasons that it's better to knock Vivi unconscious than have her escape through the window. Ivrin tries to get in the way and reasons that if anything were to leave a scratch on Vivi, their futures would be at stake. He tells Quinn he'll have to go through him if he wants to harm Vivi, but quickly falters when he points the dagger at him instead. As Ivrin tries to play it cool, Vivi uses her pheromones to put Quinn to sleep. Ivrin pretends to have fallen asleep too, but Vivi catches him, revealing that she used pheromones on Quinn only. He is shocked to learn that she can control her pheromones that way and lets her leave the carriage with Ash. On the other hand, Argan hunts down all the rabbit bandits and finally catches up to Avon Ravian, who is distraught to see him approaching her in the middle of the forest. After he slashes one of her men, Avon yells that he can't get away with threatening an aristocrat. He in turn tells her she can't get away with ambushing a carriage belonging to the Grace family either. When she feigns ignorance to it, 
he simply says that he doesn't know anything about threatening an aristocrat either. As he approaches her, she tells him he can't get away with harming a noblewoman, but Ahin reveals that she will no longer be a noblewoman following the crimes that the head of the Ravian family has committed. A small white rabbit then comes out of the bushes whom Ahin compares to Vivi. He tells her to go back since the scene playing out before him won't be too pleasant to watch, but the rabbit ends up clinging to his leg instead. He returns his attention to Vivi's mother, who demands to know what crimes the Ravian family head, her husband, has committed, but Ahin demands she answers his question first. He asks her how many times she gave the illicit drug to Vivi, and after trying to drag it out a little, she reveals that she gave it to her three times before she turned four. Ahin points out how sick she must have been from the first time, but Avon still gave it to her two more times. He wonders if she gave it to Vivi's younger brother, Carrie, too. She says she didn't, to which she mentions how it must have been because she thought Vivi wasn't taking her human form because of the drug's side effects. Angrily, Avon calls that drug a miracle remedy and mentions how everyone in the Hodevor territory who took it had no problems taking on their human forms. Ahin reminds her that this so-called miracle remedy is actually an illegal drug and goes on to ask her why, now of all times, she's left her estate and come after Vivi. She shamelessly claims it isn't a crime to claim back one's child and that her daughter doesn't seem opposed to it. Ahin gives away a menacing grin and mocks her for coming after Vivi only after Carrie's death, claiming that she wouldn't have spared her a single glance if her beloved son hadn't died. Avon yells and reprimands him for talking so lightly about her son's death, and Ahin rebukes her by calling out on her hypocrisy, saying that abandoning Vivi in a forest to be devoured by panthers isn't offensive to her, but mentioning a dead person's death is. Then he unsheathes his sword and threatens to kill her, mentioning that since she's the mother of the woman he loves, he only talked to her hoping for his mind to change. Avon demands to know what he meant by the crimes committed by the Ravian family head, and he reveals that the fire that broke out on the rabbit chief's birthday was meant to burn the import and export records of business families like the Ravians. He further reveals that he knows Carrie was handling their illicit drug business when he was killed by the storm, and that the records that her husband may have meant to burn are still safe and sound with the rabbit chief. Furthermore, the clan chief has allowed him to take both her and her husband's heads in exchange for information on their drug business. Just as he raises his sword to finish her off and Avon begs for his mercy, Vivi shows up in her rabbit form. Ahin mentions how he has been waiting for her to show up and Avon is confused to see her in her rabbit form. She calls her her baby and reaches out for her but the devastated Vivi turns away and goes to Ahin instead. He asks her if she's satisfied with it, and she lifts her paws for him to hug her and take her home. As the two walk away with Ash, Avon watches them, stranded on the ground. As Vivi returns home, she recalls what happened on the way from the carriage to the forest. As she ran with Ash to find Ahin, she came across an injured rabbit, and after healing him, reverted to her rabbit form. But she admits how it was for the best since, while hiding as a rabbit in the bushes, she got to see a glimpse of what resided in both her mother's and a hen's hearts. After hearing what her mother had to say, she renounced all her ties with the Ravian family. Moreover, she heard him calling her the woman he has feelings for. Back in the present, a hen is sulking on his desk and wondering why he had to say it out loud only for Vivi to hear it. He laments how his efforts to maintain his chilly and cool image have all shattered, now that Vivi is distancing herself from him thanks to a slip of tongue. He sighs and calls Vivi the Lady Nymph, only for Ivorin to hear it and side with Vivi. Ahin then remembers how he hasn't punished his subordinate for letting her leave the carriage and Ivorin panics under his menacing gaze, mentioning how he couldn't do anything since Quinn had his dagger pointed at Vivi. Then he turns to a trembling Quinn who faints under his bloodthirsty sight. Ivorin then reveals how Vivi aimed her pheromones precisely at Quinn before managing to escape. Impressed, he wonders why he hasn't assigned a tutor to hone her skills yet. Ivorin recommends that he ask his mother to find someone suitable since she has all sorts of connections. He nods his head in agreement and questions about the Ravian family. 
Ivorin reveals that they are being questioned by the rabbit chief and are currently under surveillance. Ahin mentions how unhappy he is to let them walk away with all four limbs intact, but worries if he had done anything more, Vivi's attention would have turned to them completely. Ivorin then informs him that his attention needs to be elsewhere at the moment, referring to Vara. Ahin says it can't be helped, since the panther poses a threat to Vivi, he must be disposed of. But then he turns his attention out of the window on Ivorin's cue and witnesses a duel between Vivi and Vara. He asks who set them up to it, and Ivorin answers that Lady Rabbit wanted it to happen since she must have discovered the vicious panther only submits to those superior to him. As the duel begins, he watches Vivi proficiently evade Vara's attacks, causing Ivorin to mention that she has the spirit of an army general. The fight continues until Vivi uses her pheromones to put him to sleep. The victory makes her dance around in joy, and as she beams with happiness, a stunned Ahin watches her from his window, blushing. Ivorin expresses joy over getting to witness her first step towards the conquest of the entire continent, and wonders if Ahin would show Vara some mercy now that the rabbit has defeated him. He is too stunned at Vivi's feats to answer immediately, but eventually postpones his decision at Vara's disposal. A happy Vivi plops down on Ahin's desk, only to find news in the papers about the infamous love triangle between her, the lion, and the black panther. Embarrassed, she tears it apart only for Ahin to question if she's going to fight newspapers now too. Just as soon as she spares a glance at him, she is reminded of what he said in the forest. The words resonate in her mind over and over, the woman that I love and wonders if he meant what she thinks he meant. Her heart starts thumping at the mere sight of him, and she mentions how beautiful he is, so much so that she'll never get tired of looking at him. He then mentions that she has a nosebleed and she plays it cool, only for a hint to call her a perverted rabbit. Vivi blames him for seducing her with his good looks and mentions how for a second she was about to give him her liver, gallbladder, and everything. Ahin then caresses her cheek and asks her if she's sleepy. The touch reminds her of his dialogue back in the forest again, and she wonders if she should acknowledge his feelings. She folds her arms together in a heart shape and winks at him, only for him to misjudge that she doesn't want to sleep yet. Suggesting that they work some more, he shifts his attention back to the papers. Flustered, Vivi stumbles upon an inkpot, only for the ink to spill all over her. As he wipes her clean, he mentions knowing about the book she's reading about taming carnivores. He tells her not to rely on that book too much if she wants to tame Vara, before lowering his head on the table and mentioning that he's a carnivore too. Vivi doesn't understand it at first, but he repeats it again, and says he'll be completely tamed by her if she promises not to meet with the lion in secrecy again. The rabbit realizes he has known about her meeting with Loon all along and wants to tell him their relationship isn't what he thinks it is at all, but instead brushes her face against his and tells him that she won't meet with him again. The gesture catches the panther off guard. Blushing profusely, he gets up from his seat and changes the topic, asking if she's still not sleepy. Vivi merely smiles at him, calling him a wicked carnivore. The following morning, Vivi enjoys a nice bubble bath in a teacup on Madame Valence's watch. After admiring how adorable the rabbit looks, she proposes to find a tutor for her who would teach her basic etiquette, education, and ways to control her pheromones. She says she'll select the person Vivi likes, but if she was to recommend someone, it would be Lord Lillian. Being the dean of the Velhelm Academy, Despite being a difficult person to deal with, he would be the perfect mentor for her. She asks for her opinion on it, and although Vivi admits he's the toughest person to deal with, a flashback of him saying a hen will need her in the future helps her make her decision. In the evening, dressed up in a cute little suit, Vivi greets Lillian. He introduces himself as a hen's grandfather and the father of Madame Valence's late husband. Before beginning his lessons, 
he asks her about the newspaper article and if the mentioned where a rabbit was, by any chance, her. Trembling with embarrassment, Vivi denies the claim, explaining that although she is a were-rabbit, she isn't the nymph mentioned in the article. Knowing that she spends her time reading, Lillian also decides to test her knowledge beforehand and hits her with some brainy questions. Vivi answers his questions easily and thus, a fierce battle to outdo the other begins. Lord Lillian's questions become increasingly difficult, but Vivi answers each one of them. After the two tire themselves out, the old man congratulates her on passing his first test and thinks about how her intelligence could help her shoot an early graduation if she was at Velhelm Academy. He decides to teach her with all his might and Vivi dares him to bring it on. A few days later, as rain befalls the Grace Mansion, Vivi watches everyone dressed in black suits and gowns from her window. She wonders if it's a special occasion and thinks back to how uneasy Ahin was last night while he tossed and turned in his sleep. Deciding to find out what's going on, she bugs the servants and guards for information and they eventually reveal that they are dressed in black to commemorate the death anniversary of Madame Valence's husband and Ahin's father, Lord Idis. They further inform her that his father passed away from a chronic illness when Ahin was still a child. His illness was known only to a few people in the family, and as soon as Vivi remembers Ahin's seizures that no one in the family knows about, she joins all the dots together and figures that he's possibly suffering from the same disease as his father. After turning into a human all on her own, Vivi looks through his closet to find something that would fit her but fails. Then she recalls Mamie telling her about a secret door in his closet that could tend to her if she was ever in a desperate situation. As she opens the said door, she finds a room full of clothes and shoes for her. Calling a hen a wicked little carnivore, she dresses up in a light gown and decides to head out. Just then, Quinn starts pecking his beak against the window, and although she lets him in, Vivi immediately cages him so he doesn't tell the panther about her whereabouts. As he keeps squeaking at her, she wonders if he's asking how she turned into a human. She reveals that it happened once she made her pheromones explode within herself, recalling that every time she turned human, aside from inhaling pheromones and drugs, it was because some carnivore's pheromones churned hers and made them explode within her body. The explosion would always cause her to change forms, so when she tried to do it with her own pheromones, it worked. Before leaving, she throws some chopped strawberries into Quinn's cage and promises to let him out once she gets back. Turning around, she wonders how she could leave the room without the guards noticing. Varus wishes her tail at her, asking her to get on her back. Both Ash and Vivi are touched by the sweet gesture, and with his help, Vivi easily evades the mansion guards and ends up at the greenhouse. When she gets there, she greets the guards and scolds them one by one, Felton, for chopping carrots and sneaking them into her meals, saying that she gets sick from them, and Mirian for calling her Lady Rara, telling him to choose a different name. As the two faint from the realization that the little rabbit is now a human, Vivi quietly steps inside. She finds Lord Lillian seated on one of the tables and he greets her, saying that she looks like a were-panther when she walks around with Ash and Vara. He sighs, affirming that she for sure isn't a forest nymph at least, given her disheveled hair. When she sulks, he offers to do her hair for her as payback for when she did his, after knocking him unconscious. As he ties her strands into a neat braid, he asks if she has done her homework yet. She immediately answers his academic questions, and he admits that when he first saw her, he thought she was cursed. But now that he has got to know her better, he thinks she's too innocent to be living with a rascal like Ahin. She lightly laughs at the accusation, but her expression turns serious all of a sudden, and she reveals that she's here to talk to him about something important. He asks her to call him Grandfather, instead of Lord Lillian, complaining about how Ahin keeps calling him an old man. She nods her head and asks him what he meant by it when he said that Ahin will need her, and if he knew about her heaving pheromones back then. Lord Lillian reveals that when he arrived at the estate, he had a burn on his arm that didn't heal even after he tried multiple remedies to heal it. But after their confrontation at the library, it healed up like it never was there. 
It was his first time witnessing such pheromones, so after doing some research and digging into some encyclopedias, he discovered that her pheromones were in fact the heaving kind. But since they are rare, he assumed it must be difficult for her to control them. This became the reason why he volunteered to train and teach her to hone her skills. He apologizes for not doing it out of the goodness of his heart and reveals that he just wants her to help her in. He then playfully asks her what kind of relationship she has with his grandson, and she immediately starts blushing and fidgeting, causing him to take back his question. He mentions she's talented enough to answer his questions with her body language alone and need not put it in words. After tying her braid, he settles down on the chair in front of her and asks Elle if she knows what today is. Vivi answers that she does and Lillian goes on to tell her his late son's tragic tale. Although he belonged to a high-ranking aristocratic family, Idis's body was too frail to house their strong pheromones and he wasn't qualified to become the clan chief's spouse either. But because of his innocently beautiful face, he became Lady Valence's lover and then her beloved husband. But his weak body kept on falling ill and he would constantly find himself lying in his bed. He asks Vivi if she has heard of something called a pheromone seizure. She freezes as she recalls his last episode, picturing him huffing and sweating in his bed. Lillian reveals that it was a pheromone seizure that caused Idis' death and he passed away the year Ahin turned five. He reassures her that Ahin is fine since he inherited his mother's superior bloodline and mostly takes after her. He further thanks heaven for his nephew hasn't had a single seizure yet, while Vivi watches him wide-eyed, trembling in pain. Meanwhile, Ahin returns to his room to find that Vivi has left with Vara. He scolds Quinn for not keeping an eye on her, but the bird twitches and calls him overprotective, not that he hears anything. As he walks away to reach the greenhouse as soon as possible, he wonders how Vivi turned into a human despite not having access to the perineum or another person's pheromones. And if she did turn human anyway, why didn't she wait on him and run away with Vara instead? As he walks away as quickly as possible, he wonders why she must make him so anxious. When he reaches the greenhouse, he finds his grandfather elegantly drinking his tea with Vivi's cape draped around his shoulders. He wonders how to unsee it and asks him what he's wearing in his day and age. He questions Vivi's whereabouts and Lillian reveals she has just left. He takes off her cape and hands it over to Ahin, revealing that she gave it to him because she felt too warm. Then he asks about her family, saying that her rather clumsy manners give the impression of a commoner. Ahin reveals that she's from a mid-ranked aristocratic family, but he has caused her family's downfall. As Lillian spits on his tea from the shock, he yells if he's out of his mind. His demeanor quickly changes and he says that a middle-ranked aristocratic family sounds like an acceptable engagement match for him. But Ahing leaves the conversation midway, causing Lillian to let out a sigh and wonder why he's devoid of manners. Once his grandson leaves, his dejected eyes cast down, wishing for him to stay healthy, and he whispers that he won't be able to endure another loss if Ahin were to part with him too. Ahin returns to his room after searching for Vivi all over the estate, only to find it dark and empty. After questioning the confined Quinn, he finds Vivi hiding and sulking below a table. He drapes her cape over Quinn's cage and walks up to her, only to find her sniffling and trembling. He kneels and asks her if his grandfather told her something strange, and she merely sniffs and scratches her hand. When he tries to stop her from hurting herself, she slaps his hand away. With tears in her eyes, she asks him why he didn't tell her anything about his seizures and reveals that she knows Lord Idis died from the same disease. She asks him why he didn't tell even his grandfather anything, let alone anyone else. He notices her scratching her hands again and tries to stop her, but she pushes him away once more and lashes out, demanding to know how many seizures he has had to date. When he doesn't answer, she says she could give him the benefit of the doubt and understand why it must have been difficult to tell his grandfather, but she's been with him and has witnessed his seizures already. She questions why he didn't even let her know about the seriousness of the disease and that he might die from it. The final sentence leaves a terrified expression on her face as she blankly stares at him. 
Ahin asks her what she'd have done had he told her about it. Vivi stutters as he leans in closer to her, and right before his fangs touch her neck, she pushes him away, trembling in fear. Ahin mentions she's gone pale, but she tries to collect herself and return to their conversation. But when she struggles to do so, he asks her as she's scared of him. Her expression testifies her fear, and Ahin stands up to leave, proposing they talk about this later. Vivi stops him from leaving and tells him that she can help him with his seizures, reminding him of how she calmed him down with her pheromones the last time he had one. He smiles, but says that despite it all, she hasn't even taken on her permanent human form yet. She cries at every little thing, and is so afraid of him that she can't breathe. He wonders what she hopes to accomplish in this state, and what's the guarantee that she won't end up having a seizure herself if she uses her already unstable pheromones too much to heal him. He advises that she take care of her own body before she can hope to help somebody else. Hearing this infuriates Vivi, and she grabs him by the collar and pushes him against the wall. She yells at him that she turned into a human today, all on her own and with her power. In fact, she has adjusted her pheromones so that she can turn back into a rabbit anytime too. She admits that she has had difficulties with her transformation all along, but today is the first time that she has accomplished something on her own. Moreover, Although she has had a pheromone seizure before, it was only because she inhaled too many pheromones and illicit substances. On the other hand, it's a hin who can't even control his own pheromones, and thus needs to take care of his own body before lecturing somebody else. She says she'll find a way to control her pheromones, and since they have helped ease his seizures once, she'll use them to treat him somehow. Her confident speech falters under his piercing gaze, and he asks her if she has thought about the fact that he might be using her healing abilities and taking advantage of her. Vivi admits that the thought has crossed her mind, but he wouldn't call her the person in her heart if this was the case. Moreover, even if it is his real intention, she doesn't mind it. She survived thanks to him, and it's only natural that she wants to repay him for his kindness. He questions if they fail to treat him completely, Will she be by his side to ease his seizures forever? Vivi says that she will, and Ahin takes her trembling hands in his and kisses them. Touching his mouth, she proposes that they should try it out and see if it works. But as soon as his fangs make contact with her fingers, she starts trembling in fear once again. Ahin holds her hand and leads a soft kiss on her palm instead, before she starts going on about how she plans to stay by his side forever until his seizures stop. He then holds her waist and kisses her forehead before settling her in his lap. He asks her how he should take everything that she has said to him, and says that it seems like she'll stay by his side until the end, if his seizures never go away. Vivi blushes and calls him a brazen carnivore, before settling comfortably in his embrace. Ahin wonders who would have thought the next patriarch of the Grace household would crawl under the paws of a rabbit he took in but Vivi denies him ever being that kind to her and reminds him how he wanted to make a salad out of her in the morning. He chuckles and proposes that they should start right now and pushes her against the floor. As he leans in to kiss her, she tightly shuts her eyes and pouts her lips in anticipation. The expression makes Ahin crawl onto the floor laughing which only embarrasses Vivi. As she tries to sneak away, he catches her by the arm and chastely kisses her. When they part away, he asks if it was unpleasant to her. A flustered Vivi shakes her head, before saying it wasn't unpleasant at all. Then he tricks her into opening her mouth and passionately kisses her again. She lovingly embraces him on the floor, but complains that she can't breathe once he pulls away. When he tries to kiss her again, she tells him to take a break and he plops down on her, laying his head on her shoulder. He calls her a greedy rabbit for not telling him to stop and mumbles, complaining about why they must stop. While he clings to her like a needy child, he uses his fangs to leave a mark on her neck, but unfortunately, the mere sight of his sharp teeth makes her fall unconscious. And that brings us to the end of this season. Unfortunately, there aren't enough chapters to continue the story at this time. We apologize for any disappointment this may cause, but we hope you'll be patient and wait a few months for the next season. In the meantime, we've started a new and exciting story. You can find it right here.